We are recording. Roger Theron in the studio. Episode number, I think this is going to go out as episode 202, I think. Oh, Welcome. Uh, good Thank to get you. Yeah, good, pleasure to meet you recently. Yeah, very, glad, uh, very glad to meet um, someone who's a benefit, I say a beneficiary, who has benefited from the good work of Jeremy, Jeremy Gibson Forces Farming. I've talked yeah. about a bunch of times on the podcast, but never met, it, like... Is he telling the truth? Is, does he actually help people? Oh no, it's real. Yeah. There's Roger. Look at Roger. <laughs> I'm only joking. I've yeah. never, I've never questioned you, Jeremy. No, it's good to, it's good to have you here, mate. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries. Um, I, th- you, you, one of very few South Africans I've had on as well. Hmm. hmm. I think maybe only one other. Chris Cox. I had Chris Cox on. You were Chris Cox. No. He wrote Fire Force. He, he wrote about the Rhodesian, the Bush War, the Rhodesian Wars, and. Um, uh, the Rhodesian Light Infantry and uh, the uh, Son of Scouts and all that. Okay. He's, he's, oh, I'll have to look into Yeah. It. He's a, oh, I've got his book in, yeah. Oh, he's, is that there? I'll, I'll check you the book. Oh, okay. Quality. He's like, yeah. I think he describes himself as like the unofficial historian for the RLA, Son of Scouts and all that, and that time as well, okay. that time period, yeah. 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 Have you have you heard of that guy called, um, I think he calls himself Jacko Yaku. Um, he, um, Oh gosh, I can't remember his um, surname now, but he he does like um, like Paralympic cycling now because he got he got blown up. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, he's uh, Power Edge, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Well, he, he's been some someone's referred him to me to come on the podcast. Yeah. So yes, I have heard of him. Yeah, he'd be really interesting. Yeah, to talk to him. Well, he was up. Uh, he was in Birmingham last year or the year before, which isn't far from here. Yeah, I never. Uh, I met him once actually at a sports event um, for in the oh, army, yeah. but. Um, yeah, oh, that's when you said you'd interviewed one. I was like, oh, it's going to be him. Oh, <laughs> right. No, 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 not yet. No, no, yeah, it will happen. It will happen. What's it, uh, what's it like? Um, how much of a part did like the, the military history of South Africa play in your your decision to join the British military? Not much. Um, oh, that's the end of that conversation. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I grew up watching, um, so I grew up, I guess in the late eighties and and nineties, and um, the, there was loads of Vietnam War movies, so that was my idea of what a soldier was, um, because that that was um, there was this there was a series. Um, uh, oh, it was it was uh, redubbed in in South Africa because uh, Afrikaans is a, a, a mm, not the main language, I guess, but. It's a big one. Lo- loads of the TV programs, they dubbed it into Afrikaans. And then if you wanted to listen to it in English, you had the telly on and the radio on, and you tuned into the right channel and t- muted the telly, and then you could watch it in English. They were playing the, the film audio through the radio. Yeah. So you could choose which language you wanted to watch it in. <laughs> that's, that's mad. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It, it, it worked really then. well, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and there was a series. Um, Literally translated, the title was Mission Vietnam, but it was uh, called something else, I think, in, in America where it was made. And um, that was an awesome series that that I watched. And, like, um, yeah, and I just loved, like, G.I. Joe's growing up. Yeah. So it was... Was yeah. Mission Vietnam MASH? Was that MASH? No. No, it okay. Is, um, the theme song was um, Painted Black by Rolling Stones. I wonder what that was. It was awesome. Was it? Yeah. I want to say there was a guy called Terence Fox who was in it. Right. Um, so go on. The, the, I'm going to look yeah. for it. While you're talking, I'm going to look yeah. for it online. But um, the yeah. So what were you saying about the G.I. Joes? Yeah, I just loved playing with G.I. Joes. When I, when I was a kid, it was either army stuff or cowboys. That's what I wanted. That's what I loved as a kid. Yeah. Um, so so then, um, yeah, growing, um, two of my friends joined the British Army um, ahead of me. And then I went on and did like university and basically... Um, for all intents and purposes, wasted years of my life that I could have. Um, I mean, it made me a different person, but I was kind of behind because I I did I spent a lot of time pursuing paths that I didn't end up following. Um, but they, those two friends are probably the biggest influence on me coming to join the British Army, as opposed to my dad was in the South African Army. Oh yeah, and he was very proud that he was a, a permanent force, not because he, he had conscription um, in his day. Um, so he, if you were a permanent force, it was like you weren't just there because you were doing your your national 
duty you were actually signed up um, and there was a distinction there between the those two kinds of well, I guess a bit like reservist and um, permanent yeah mm. or, um, yeah but yeah but I think I, I had really different ideas when I joined uh, and then also because later in life well, when obviously when uh, Iraq and everything was was kicking off you just think of like warm weather sand and and stuff like that and then you come over here and uh actually most of it is a uh, rain and rain and mud oh, and UK. cold yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> um how old were you when you joined uh 30 i think oh, that I was, is older uh, yeah, yeah jesus yeah yeah, yeah. really old there See, was I... one guy older than me in um in phase one training so that made me feel a bit better but i mean i was a good 10 at least 10 years older than a lot of the guys yeah i mean i when i joined i was when I joined, I was 19. Mm. When I joined up to start training, I was 19, yeah. and I thought that was old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was old. Yeah. Can you imagine being a sick... Can you imagine being like one of the 16-year-olds uh, who went, 16-year-old joined yeah. up, going to have a get 16-year-old. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, you, when you when we were doing the icebreaker before this, mm. you mentioned about your great your great granddad on your mum's side just my granddad yeah your granddad yeah, on your mum's yeah. side was he military um he was he was in um he was in egypt um in world war Two. um but yeah so he he had my mum when he was quite old already i think he was in his 50s um so uh he passed away when he was 94 and i think that was about 96 <coughs> when he passed away um and yeah, so I didn't really know him very. Well. I was young, um, you know, when he when he died. Um, but I just, from my mum and her brother, um, they just told me a lot about his character and stuff like that. And um, I, I've, uh, I guess the way people talk these days is to say I identify with with him how his character was portrayed to me. So, what um, kind of a guy was he? Um, like slow to anger. Um, but he did have a temper, so, um, and just really gentle, um, and so he was a farmer, um, and yeah, loved his horses, um, and just a, just a, like, stable guy, <laughs> <laughs> and dependable, you know? Yeah. Um. Uh, and calm. I think that that's something I really aspire to try. As I'm as I'm getting older, I'm trying to to have that. We were talking also about um, people that you look up to, and like leaders to me that are they're always the same. That I high, I hold I mean, those. Temperament. Yeah, yeah. I hold those leaders in high regard. Where there's nothing worse than having a boss who is just all over the place you know you never know what you're going to get one day he comes in and he's this way and the next day he's your best friend and then um yeah so yeah like a, d a dependable temperament of um it doesn't matter what you're going through that you don't take that out on other people um mm. yeah uh yeah there aren't many people like that around anymore are there yeah i think uh it's, there's a there's a lot of old school values that I think have gone by the wayside that um, I try to hold on to those. Yeah. It seems... It, yeah, it's a good good, good point, actually. Mm. It, does there maybe seem to be more of a expectation of people these days to become a little bit erratic when something isn't going their way and, de you know, and deal with it almost irrationally or present that kind of anger, yeah. outrage mm. face to it? You know, which is not what you want when you you know when you're describing your uh, your granddad there. I was thinking, yeah, that's like that is just the reliable individual. That if yeah. the world is going to shit, you know, you can go to you yeah. know, there's something there, a rock. There's a rock yeah. there. You can go and 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 get some solace from it, some advice from it. There's always a bit of stability there. Yeah. You know, in a situation where you may not know what's going on, and those kind of people always appear, even if they don't. They always appear to know what to do yeah. what what how to deal with things yeah. because of that calmness i think yeah um 
I think it's really confusing these days because uh, mental health has been highlighted a lot, and um, but I feel like there's so much awareness of of mental wealth, but people <coughs> don't really actually know what to do with it apart from be aware from it of it. Um, it's just my my perception of it, and like so, not bottling up your feelings is a is a big thing. You know, you have to release, but sometimes I wonder if um, people are letting their feelings out too much. Um, so to be that dependable person, you have to be able to you have to be able to put things or hold things in, so that you can um, communicate to somebody without letting those feelings that you have come to the fore because they're not relevant to that situation. But you need to balance it because you can't bottle everything up all the time because then you're going to blow up at some point. So I I just feel with all the... Um, I just feel like people talk about mental health a lot, which is great, but I I don't feel like there's... I don't know. It's talking about a problem, but I don't know what the solutions are necessarily. Um, yeah, I think... So, yeah, you're right. I, I think people people be more aware of it is definitely mm. good, you know, and people be more willing to talk or to express if they're really having a bad time yeah. is good, you know, yeah. especially on the bloke side, you know, yeah. you know, we we that 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 uh not stigma, that sort of uh what's the word, what's the word? Um stereotype of blokes not expressing their feelings and yeah. they need to open up more. That's uh, we we do that because it's benefited us in the past, mm. like in our ancestry. Mm. Like, you know, if you historically, if you talk, if a if a, a, a woman is looking for a a woman is looking for a stable stable partner, and you know, uh, a male talking about how how bad they're feeling, yeah. or and I'm talking like thousands of years ago, how mm. bad they're feeling, would be an indication of mental instability, yeah. indication of likely physical issues as well than the line mm. likely of possibly poor genetics right i'm just you know yeah, in the yeah. past so that's yeah. why we don't do it because it's mm. not what it is historically not women wanted to hear mm. or see it's yeah. like no oh, no i'll rephrase that it would just make them less likely to find a mate yeah right? um but on the on the bottling it up aspect i see mm. two so i see two sides to that phrase mm. so on the one i think you've got the internal bottling it up so, and I've definitely done this myself in the past, where mm. I'm bottling it up internally. What I mean by that is I'm not looking at why I'm feeling a certain way and trying to understand it myself yeah. or even acknowledging it. I feel depressed. I feel sad. I feel unhappy. I feel angry. Why? But So I'm not doing that. Not just suppressing it. Why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. So not even looking at it. Just suppress it. Mm. Ignore it. Right. That's the one side. And I think to be able to get to the point where you may need to express it outwardly to someone because it may benefit you or others sometimes. Mm. You need to have done that phase one first. Accept, acknowledge that you're feeling this way and try and understand why. Most of the time you can you can work it out yourself. Yeah. It's, it's re but it's not a pleasant thing to do. Mm. I certainly don't like acknowledging where I'm not feeling good. I, mm. I don't like it at all. Because in the back of my mind, I think you sh you're better than this, you're stronger than this, you're more resilient than this, mm. you know, but I have to know, I have to know. Um, because it's, I haven't done it in the past and it hasn't worked out very well for me, mm. you know. So I think that's, there's two sides to it. Yeah. You know, you've got to yeah. not bottle it up inside for yourself, understand it, acknowledge it, and then if there is a situation where it benefits you to say outwardly, yeah, I'm mm. not great. I, I, like, I, I, I enjoy now and like the fact now that myself and several close friends around me when we ask how each other's doing, mm. we answer openly, honestly. Mm. And I don't feel ashamed by it. If I'm having a bad time, I say, fucking crap, crap, yeah. bad at the minute. Why? Work, stress, family, stress, I've got stuff going on, I'm just not good at the minute. I'm, I'm trying to get on top of it. Yeah. You know? See, I think it's really special to to be able to find a friendship like that because that's not normal. Um, to People don't normally open up with each other like that unless you have a a good trusting friendship um well i think it's more well that, maybe it's not normal for me <laughs> no i think no i don't think it's about the, the relationship i've got with these people i talk to because i'll do mm. it with anyone i think it's more that when i when, when people ask how are you doing mm. i'll answer honestly most of the time I'm doing great sometimes and it could just be you know people have bad days it could just be you know 
hard work at the minute. Lots on. Again, could be work, could be anything. Yeah. But the point is, I'll answer honestly. Interestingly, I'll do it at work as well. Mm. So at work, whereas and, and I do feel slightly different doing that. I'm always a little bit concerned that if I if I do give a and a lot of pressure at the minute, it's hard work. Are they thinking about oh? His, my prospects for like promotion in the yeah. future or do, what do they think any less of me in terms of if they you know if, in my peer group or whatever but I still mm. trying to answer honestly mm. and one of the main reasons is I want to encourage others to do the same yeah yeah you know I'm sure that does do that because it gives awareness we, of the yeah. state of your team and your people and your friends and, yeah you know. and when you open up like that then they're more likely to open up to you yeah um I I've always had um fewer friends and close friends that are few um that i can speak to like that um yeah but uh, but i think going back to um to what you were saying about just letting all your feelings out i think um it, it yeah my my what i was saying there was like i think it's wise to to know the people that you can speak to about things because um in my experience speaking to the wrong people d just feels I don't know, like, um, what do you call it? Like gossip and stuff like that. Um, uh, which I've, I've come across more often than. Well, go on, I, what do you mean? Well, among uh, men? Um, That's a highly sexist thing to say, <laughs> but I think it's fair to say. I'll say in the army. Oh! Yeah. In the oh, army. really? Yeah. Go on. Um, just, just realizing that you need to be careful who you express your. Who you confide in. Yeah. Yeah, because. Uh, like you were saying with career stuff, people used things. They'd go and say, talk about you and what you'd said to somebody else and even twist it slightly. Oh, well, um, they are not nice people. They are no. not good people. <laughs> no. Yeah, but you get um, them. Always, um, my, um, coming my, a bit, coming a bit my staff sergeant um, at one point was saying to me um, that I need to learn to blag better. Like... I just never blagged. He said, I'm a terrible blagger. It, it, um, but what did he mean by blag? Well, we, so we were working in, in G4 and supply chain side yeah. of things. And so you have, you always have all these um, uh, like inspections of the different procedures and stuff like that. And um, a lot of it is just to make sure you've ticked boxes that are just tick boxes for the sake of having tick boxes. <laughs> and um, I'd get asked questions that um, maybe it was like... I don't know. I guess the way it looks then to the to the chain of command is that I don't know my job because I said I don't know, um, and they don't they don't like to hear I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so people would would just be really good at blagging, um, and uh, I sometimes thought the chain of command can see that they're blagging, but they don't mind because they they've got the answer that they were looking for, um, and yeah. So some people didn't like me within my um within my chain of command like up to regimental level because they thought i was just like i don't know yeah, maybe they thought i was too useless. honest not playing yeah, the game yeah yeah not willing to toe the line yeah and i know what you mean but then yeah so then i would I'd, <laughs> I'd go complain about things to to colleagues that i thought were silly or something like that and then and then th that would come around and then those people that already th already thought one way about me because I had been that not blagging, um, just uh, they yeah I just found that people use things against you if you're not careful um, who you confide in. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad I didn't really experience any of that, and I think, that's uh, but that's not to say it didn't happen. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like uh, you you get it in it's like anything in different parts of. Any organisation, yeah. you're going to get just horrible pieces of it. The wrong people in the wrong place at the wrong time, yeah. in jobs and roles where they can exploit their, where they can exploit other people mm. because of their 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 like character flaws. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it, right. the other thing with 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 the military is that the co the command appointments are really short. Yeah. You know, like the only couple of years. So if you, you know, if you're one of these commanders or leaders with one of these character flaws you're just trying to get up to the next level you're gonna you are gonna try and blag it for two years yeah yeah you know and it and it encourages people below to tick the boxes when they shouldn't be ticking the boxes or yeah. give this answer when they shouldn't be giving this answer you know to to get to mm. help the leader yeah you can see how it becomes a it becomes like a badge of honor to be a good blagger because <laughs> <laughs> because people get away with stuff that you know, or they, they excel even though they're struggling. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, so people would often um, like talk about blagging like it was a good thing, um, um, whereas I I like to just be honest. Um, uh, yeah, I forget. I've lost the train of thought now. You couldn't yeah. be a politician for sure. No, couldn't no. be a politician. No way. No <laughs> way. Long. Well, you could be. You wouldn't be successful at it. No. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be a blagger. Yeah. What uh, do you see? Much do you, when you uh, in, in living and working over here because you join when you're older, which mm. means that. Well, you, you know, your perception, experience of things is different compared mm. to the younger guys you joined. But how does being in the UK contrast with being in South Africa in terms of well, work, civil wise, but also, mm. yeah, and like society, culture wise, just life. Because um, they're very, they're a very yeah, different beasts, so the British and the South Africans. Very different, yeah. Um, sometimes I, sometimes I think back to it, like where my first exposure really to, to like. Uh, English people <laughs> was when I was in high school. We had a, a school from, I think they were from um, Hull. Is Hull in Liverpool? No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it is no. not. Were they from Liverpool? <laughs> it's or up Hull? north. It's, yeah. it's it's on the east coast. Yeah, but, um, oh, I think it's on the east coast. It's on the east, anyway, northeast. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember if they were from Hull or Liverpool because I, I met somebody from Hull. Oh God. Anyway, this the school, is it was called Birkenhead. It, you know. The yeah. school was called Birkenhead. Okay. Anyway, they came to play hockey, and they <laughs> uh, they came to play hockey, and they were touring the different schools in South Africa, and they came to to my school, and basically their team would split up and have host families. Birkenhead's Liverpool. I'm just looking. Oh, okay, at, yeah, cool. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so um, <laughs> that, this was my first exposure to like um, young people from from England. Yeah. And. Um, they they came over and they had like the new Jamiroquai CD. That's where this is what 90s. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jamiroquai CD going deeper underground, like Godzilla. Oh yeah, kind of yeah, thing. yeah. And um, and one of them had a really cool uh, Casio digital watch, and yeah. um, he left the watch behind. That's what I remember. Oh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did he leave it behind? It came up, or yeah. did someone orchestrate no, it? it, it just, I think the CD as well. I think they left both of them there. By accident? Yeah. Well, I'm assuming so. Or secret gifts. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, my brother got the watch. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, they they were very different. I could just, they, they were, um, it made me realize that we're quite a conservative um, uh, culture in South Africa. Um, so why did you draw that? Compa- how did you draw that comparison? What was different? Um, their language, like um, yeah, just the like in terms of like uh, swearing and stuff like that. We latch, we are sharing about six inches. You keep, you keep, you, li- I keep it, yeah, yeah, you keep leaning mic. back and going yeah. away from the microphone. Yeah, go okay. For it. Um, yeah, they, they were just. Um, I guess the word I would use is maybe crass, just. Or vulgar. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, think that's, I think that's just scouses. Yeah. That's, that's the scouses, yeah. mate. Liverpool. Yeah. Crass and vulgar. Yeah. Nothing's changed. It's not just yeah. the school kids. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, they they just uh, they just seemed a lot more clued up on things that I guess were at a, a higher age than what we were at the time. Oh, interesting. They were like ahead of their age. But so, so where so but. Could that be partly because they're from a city? Yeah. And I'm assuming yeah, you were not. Yeah, that all would cut, you know, no. where, So where were you? Where was so, it? So, I don't know what the population was of my town, but it was a, it was not a city. Like, so Cape Town is, it was, is the closest city. And then we were about an hour's drive outside of Cape Town. It wasn't like a, like a village, I guess like a small town. Mm. Um, it's hard to compare to here because everything's much more spread out mm. where um yeah the, the the houses are like what you call a bungalow here there's like a normal house there um but they <coughs> they're much bigger because the because there was more land available for building on i guess um but yeah and then when i was um when i was getting older we, there used to be a two year w- work permit that you could get like a holiday visa holiday work visa so loads of south africans would come over here and work for a year or so and then bring back the pounds to south africa and multiply it by 17 Mm. um and that was that would set you up for like going to university or or just um 
having some extra money. And um, people would come back with the stories of like, um, yeah, it just seemed like a very promiscuous and um, it, it is like city country, I guess. Um, yes. Uh, so when, yeah, that was my kind of impression of, I don't know if I'm bad. It just sounds really uh, racist against English people, probably. <laughs> These vulgar, gritty people. But um, I think um, when when I went uh, later in life, I went over to South Korea and I realized that it's also they were way... Um, they, in South Korea, they were wearing clothes and things that, that uh, two years later they were wearing here. Um, oh. And... Um, because I went to Korea and then I came over here oh, and I saw that kind of a continuation of stuff changing in terms of like fashion or what I know, my limited idea of fashion. But um, yeah, I just felt, I think um, South Africa is conservative in the terms of just being behind the curve like that. So I haven't been back there since 2014 or 15. Um, so I don't know how things have changed, um, you know, in the last few years. Um, but yeah, it's a much more conservative culture. Um, in, yeah. It's definitely a big difference even, even, well, anywhere in the world, I think, but even mm. in the U, you know, UK between city folk and yeah. rural folk and that, and, and that is, you know, I've noticed it in everything from sport to, mm. from sport to, again, like, going out and just socializing the way people interact mm. the language they use you know the closer you get to a city in terms of like sport wise mm. like football for example the closer you get to a city the more uh, like the more ethnically diverse the teams are i'm, I'm mm. on about like mm. predominantly youth like football, football we're experienced it more mm. ethnically diverse the teams are the more aggressive they are the more um the more competitive they are mm. the more they you know, the younger the, the more I don't want to say vulgar the languages because mm. I swear all the time. Mm. But the more, yeah, the more liberal use of like yeah. swear words, yeah. Um, and uh, but that's, you know, but that, I think that's just driven by the more people you pack into a smaller place, you yeah, know, like a city, yeah. Then the almost like the fast, they, they, just, they just have to be you be, have to behave in a different way, yeah. And it drives different cultural ex, like norms, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Compared to you know, I grew up in I grew up in you know rural south wales in the, in the valleys mm, mm. and uh and it and this like city is like alien to me yeah. but if you go even just from there to swansea and swansea isn't like a london but it's a city in itself they were very different to yeah. you know it's uh yeah. so but also they were scousers they were scousers from liverpool how did you manage with that accent how did you manage with their accent that was really um, wild i can't remember that from those kids coming over the accent doesn't stand out to me massively Oh, that's a yeah. that's a relief. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I got the impression it was quite a posh school. Oh, okay. I don't know, Birkenhead, but he, you know, I, that maybe it's just because they had English accents or they were Scots <laughs> Scots accents. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, accents are crazy. I keep cramping in my. Why so are you cramping? You're not getting enough water. I yeah, I'm terrible at like, keeping hydrated. You gotta go carry yeah. a bottle of water. Bottle of water with you on that farm. Yeah, I don't Take do it with that. You. I don't do that. I should. You should do. Yeah, it. my wife always tells me off for not drinking enough. Water. <clears throat> Makes a big difference to my sleep and my mm. um and my energy mm. uh, if I'm hydrated. Big difference and my mood. Yeah, it elevates me a little bit more. I fully understand the the science. Of, well, not fully, but I I know it's a good thing to do, but that doesn't mean I do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean we do we do underestimate water. It's like we yeah. can go without food for what three weeks. We can't go if we stop it's drinking. Three if days, we don't have any water, three days. Yeah. That's how important water is. Yeah. And yet I won't pick up a glass of water for three days. Well, I will, but it'll be in the form of alcohol. Yeah. You know what I mean? We don't. We don't think I need to get that in me. Three days is yeah. nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Because if I have a drink in the day, it's coffee. Yeah, and I yeah. think that dehydrates you. Coffee dehydrates yeah. you. Yeah. Coffee dehydrates yeah. you. Yeah. Messes with your messes with your circadian rhythm and messes yeah. with all sorts as well. Tea does it too. Hmm. Tea is a they call it a, a, a di I think diuretic. the word is diuretic. Yeah, yeah. tea yeah. does it too, doesn't it? Yeah. But when I was when I was serving, I got told it was diuretic, which I didn't realise. Mm. Unless you put sugar in it, I think <laughs> that's bullshit. I think that I think that's bullshit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> some of the uh, some of the like eating you habits and drinking habits. With more energy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some of the eating and drinking habits you you develop or get, or or yeah or develop when you're serving. You're just yeah. mad. I saw a mad. thing on uh, Fill Your Boots the, the other day of. Um, 
you know, when you always got told not to to bend down and put your hands on your like on rest your, after fizz. And put yeah, yeah, your bend, and hunch over with your hands on your knees, and yeah. then uh, apparently it's, researchers said it's actually a really good recovery good recovery position. position. Yeah, <laughs> get your fucking hands off your yeah. knees, stand up. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god, honestly, some uh, of the stuff, yeah. wild, <clears throat> wild. Yeah, but you have to stand, just stand up and pretend like you're not like blowing <laughs> just yeah. pretend you're fine <laughs> yeah um wh- wh- so do you do you got a two-year work visa and came over here Did you do i that? didn't do it so when i came over that had just run out um I, it was something to do with uh tightening security and i think the south african passport um there was something about the south african passports that they the british government wanted there to be tighter controls on something or something that the South African government didn't comply with what the British government wanted from something to do with passports. And that meant that that visa stopped for South Africans. So you, um, I think it carried on for, for like New Zealand and Australia um, because I think the whole setup of it was something to do with the Commonwealth countries. Um, yeah, so when I came over, that had just literally, I missed it by like months. Um, so I came over just on my passport um and had to i didn't really know how i was going to do it because my my idea was come, to come over and join the army um and so i had to try to be here i had up to 6 months on my passport but i couldn't work so i had to rely on my savings um and basically get through the process to start phase 1 training within those 6 months and within my budget but then uh then i ended up um meeting my wife and we got married instead of joining the army. So I had to jump through other loopholes um, to be here legally. Um, but yeah, so, but that passport, that um, two-year work thing was uh, was a really good way to to experience life here for, mm. for youngsters. Why did you end up joining so late? Why did you? End up, what were so, you doing before that? So um, yeah, so uh, we're like. <sighs> In high school, I was um, obsessed with cycling was my sport, um, and I wanted to be a pro cyclist. So all I wanted to do when I left high school was go to Europe and and race there and do really well and get a pro contract. And and this is what, what's um, you know my my um, my uncle specifically and people older than me would were saying to me, you need a backup plan. Um, and I just thought, no, I'll just, uh, if I, if I don't make it, then I'll just coach people and, you know, just do something like that. And, um, I was never that good, never good enough to do oh, that. Oh, really? Yeah. But I, but I thought, I don't know, I was just, uh, delusional. I just was so passionate about it. Um, and. It's not a bad thing though all the time, is it? Is it? Would you say it's a. Um, passion is good. Delusion is bad. <laughs> I think. Um, I mean, the, the. the this is where it's easy to get confused um and it goes back to really actually knowing that you should trust your elders because um the great champions are single minded to probably to the point of delusion um and that they everything is about um about achieving their goal but if you are not that talented um and you but you have the full delusion <laughs> then <laughs> you you put everything you think you're putting everything towards that um it's not even a talent it's there's so much that needs to come into it you you actually need um a talented coach i didn't even have a coach because i couldn't afford it so i was just doing what i thought was right um you need a support team and um and you need the right opportunities and all of those need to come together and you need that that um, obsession with it and the focus that comes with that, all of those need to come together to to make it to the pinnacle of of a sport. Um, and if you don't have all those things lining up, and but you are delusional in thinking it's going to happen, you just um, set yourself up for failure and disappointment. Um, mm. and, but you won't know that because you, of the delusion. How did you get into cycling? How did you get into it? It's, uh, a, it's yeah. a bit, it's a bit cult-like the pro cycling thing, isn't it? It's a bit, yeah. and also the nineties wasn't that where Lance Armstrong was starting to come to the, the fore, um, being, being so, an absolute ninja. Um, 
he became a ninja. He was around when when I got into it, but not at the level that he was when he was winning the Tour de France and stuff. He, um, when I got into it, it was so n n like ninety mm, ninety ninety four ninety five. And there was, um, at that point, it was European dominated <coughs> big time. It's like um, this a Spaniard called Miguel Indurain won the Tour de France five times in a row. And that was like the first guy that ever won it five times in a row, you know. And then Lance Armstrong did it. And I don't know if Chris Froome did that. I don't think, uh -huh. I don't think so. But um, it was, I, as a youngster, I just saw everybody start getting mountain bikes. That was the, the craze. And um, I didn't have a mountain bike. But didn't you say on the icebreaker that you had a BMX gun? Yeah. On the ice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> quality, quality BMX gun. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, that that was a, that was before mountain bikes were were a thing. There was a BMXs was was yeah. what was cool, and um, yeah, I you know it's, I was always behind. I'd never actually had a BMX. I had a my friends had BMXs, but I was still in the gang. But I had a bike that was um, I don't know how to. Exc like a cheap ripoff. Yeah. Looked like a BMX. It was more Wasn't like a, a like a old old school kind of um at the top bar, you could remove the top bar to make it into a girl's bike because you know how girls bikes Oh, the cross bar at the top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You could remove that oh, take oh it off. Oh my god. And then it then it then the frame like looped down so you could climb on with the skirt. You that know? does not sound structurally yeah. sound. <laughs> <laughs> um so but I mean that that bar stayed in always obviously because I wasn't wearing skirts. <laughs> 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 not yet um, but the cool thing about the bike was that you could do a back pet you, if you pedaled backwards yeah. it did the brake yeah that's a problem yeah. though because you had to pedal all the time didn't you um no you no it was it wasn't it wasn't like a fixed gear uh. so it's you could pedal and stop oh no i remember those bikes if you oh, stop pedaling yeah it, it just it, the brakes went on yeah but, uh, that was never an issue for i learned to ride on that bike basically oh, okay. um so it wasn't an issue for me. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was really cool for like doing skids on the gravel and stuff like that. Um, I used to love, I yeah. used to love going out on the mountain bikes. I used to love it. Yeah. Love it. Me and a couple of mates used to go out all the time. Yeah. So good. It so became good. such a thing, the mountain bikes. And I used to see people um, riding around on mountain bikes, like um, like the farm workers and stuff, riding to work in the morning with these mountain bikes. And I was like, damn, like, why can't I have a mountain bike? Like these guys... These poor guys have got mountain bikes, and I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we're not that poor, mom. <laughs> and um, but so eventually, I did get a mountain bike, um, and um, and then I was like getting all these mountain bike magazines and stuff. There, because of such a big thing, there was like two two kids in my class were heavy into it, like competing at uh, provincial level, so like I guess county level here, and um, and um. But then I realized to go mountain biking, you had to put your bike in a car and take it to the place where you go mountain biking. It was really hard to go from, from the house and get there. And uh, I made another really good friend who's my closest friend um, from, from that point onwards. And he did road cycling. His whole family did. Um, and as we became better friends, I started doing that. Um, and, yeah, that's it just, was just like my friendship group was road cyclists growing up and people do get really passionate about it what did you think about the the, the doping scandal have you seen have you seen icarus uh, i started watching it oh, I, what? I mean i watched it, it. Oh, really no, yeah um I, I don't know why i lost i lost interest i was busy watching it for some reason the the dope like so before the whole armstrong thing doping was something that that people kind of knew that it was happening but it was this weird kind of um i think it was kind of accepted in secret and you know how i was saying about how it's cool to be a blagger doping is like the ultimate blagging um and it was like well I, this is as a teenager this is what i thought and it, you know it ties in with that whole delusion get a thing i guess oh so you were aware of it back then yeah it was How in all the magazines really? and stuff yeah um like what do you mean it was in the magazine so in cycling magazines um you, people would get caught every now and then basically yeah. and they'd get like a year's ban and then they'd be back or six month ban or something 
Um, but there was like the whole like science side of stuff of pro cycling was, you know, you'd go for tests where they had like a mask on you measuring your oxygen stuff. And there, it was a big thing about like your lung capacity and your VO2 max VO2 and all max. that kind of stuff. Um, and um, there was pe like stories about even when I went to Europe, there was, people would t talk um, like on an amateur level, but saying like, oh, this guy, you know, this this team, which is like a semi-pro team, like basically not really getting paid anything, but like talking about, and this is all like just rumors and stuff, but like they just eat pasta and then they have like get their vitamins intravenously. And it was just this like weird kind of... Vitamins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are vitamins are they? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just like this weird kind of dark art of like, you know, these these people have taken their bodies to such an extreme level of fitness um, and they'll do anything to to be at that level. Um, and it was almost like that desperation to be at that level warranted the means to get there or to be there. And also if everyone else is, do, if you get to that level. Yeah, and everybody's doing it. Uh, and yeah. yeah, but even if you're naive enough mm. to not realize it's happening, you get to that level and then realize, oh my God, everyone, everyone's doping. Yeah. I, I think Armstrong actually spoke about this. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, everyone's actually, if I don't do this, my dream's gone. Yeah. Like, I've got no chance of yeah. becoming who I want to be. Yeah. And it's okay to do it because everyone else is doing it. Otherwise, how do I succeed? Oh, this is the game. Yeah. I'm not making it okay, but you yeah. Know, I think, oh, was that mentioned on Icarus, mate? You need to carry on watching Icarus. Mm -hmm. There is a massive twist in that. I think that was my oh, so good. Yeah, I think that was my my thinking about it was all those people because I was always attracted to like the underdogs in the cycling, the <coughs> what they call them the domestiques, basically like the the workhorses in the team that enable the leaders <coughs> to get the big victories, and um, they were the guys. They put so much work in, and those are probably the kind of guys that get there on talent, and then they realize they've put, they've committed their whole life to get to that point. Well, you know, their teenage years and their, and their, um, it's their dream, like like the, like I experienced that delusional, but they they actually got there, and then realizing they have to, they have to do these things to stay mm -hmm. there, and then do you just some people did just leave and they i think they were some of the first like whistleblowers um yeah there was a british yeah. guy called oh i can't remember his name i saw an interview with him this is uh, this is maybe 10 years ago i saw an interview mm. five ten years ago so david, when the, david miller possibly mm. when the when the armstrong thing was came about and mm. i think he was saying that he was one of those ones who got to pro mm. realized what was going on and refused Oh. And it was it was that the the team said, well, this is you got you need to do this, or yeah. else you can't be on the team because you're not going to perform what we need you to perform. Yeah. And, and he went, no, basically kissed the dream goodbye. Mm. And I was like, yep, yeah, cheers, not doing it. And you think, fucking hell. Yeah, yeah. So David Miller did go on to dope, and he wrote books about about that because oh, he maybe a different guy. Though. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, there were there was a there was loads of guys that you'd read about and talent coming up, and then they would just disappear again. Um, and you'd also read about guys that had heart attacks and stuff like that, and um, at a young age that took stuff that they shouldn't have taken. So, yeah, it's um, it just to me it just romanticized I, everything was romanticized about the thing, the good and bad. Um, but it happens yeah. everywhere across uh, those 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 well sports which are, require like extreme physical. Uh, Talent and capability. Mm. I say everywhere. I, I assume it does. I mean, look at, look at, like sprint sprinting. I, yeah, I think, well, I've heard this something before. Where out of the twenty five, um, over the last twenty five years, the twenty five sprint world champions, something like twenty three of them have been caught for doping at yeah. some point in their career. You mm. know, something like it's something ridiculous like that. Yeah, and uh, it just hap it happens everywhere. And I think it, it will continue to happen. Mm. But I mean, in a in a in a sport like. Uh, pro cycling how would you stamp it out you'd almost mm. have to reset and like have a year of nothing yeah but restart we're restarting the clock restarting the books everything from scratch and this is our doping program but yeah. that'll never happen because that's a lot of money being wasted and and it also it would creep back in anyway yeah i think uh, as they as they develop the different tests for things that's our but then it's all it's like this game of staying ahead of it because for <coughs> like in armstrong's time they they were just testing your red blood cell level and if your if your red blood cells was like i think it was like 50 percent was the the marker 
if you had more than 50% red blood cells, then you then you were put out of competition. But they couldn't say definitely that you were doping to get there, but they would just say that it's not healthy to compete above that. Mm. So everybody would very um, carefully get their levels as close to 50% as possible through through doping, but not go over. Mm. Um, so, But then they developed a test that actually could pick up if you'd artificially got it to that level and then that's when they started getting retrospectively catching people out yeah um yeah i mean but it, it was i think uh yeah my opinion of it is i haven't really put much thought about it recently um but my opinion so it was formed in that phase of life that i was just that delusional passion um about this sport this, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's a beautiful sport when you, um, yeah, it's easy to get passionate about it, like when you're into it like that. But uh, I'm not really in that world anymore, so I haven't mm. thought about it for a long time. Do you do much fizz now? I suppose no. you don't need to with the job you're in. No, I, um, no, I don't. Well, you do, but not <laughs> recreationally. Ever. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I uh, yeah, I had to go down there the last time I ran anywhere. <laughs> but I, I do like I miss doing those stretching sessions after after fizz because I can feel I need that. So I stretch every now and then, but I don't remember to do it. Like when you do when you did the um, when you did fizz as a as a unit or a subunit, and then afterwards you stretch out. And it just actually kept you really quite healthy. I used to hate them. I used to not yeah. do them ever. Oh. I hated them. Yeah, if I could, if I could get away with it, I wouldn't do them. Yeah, I used yeah. to hate the stretching. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why I was so just I just waste of time as I mm. perceived it to be. It yeah. was not a waste of time. No. <laughs> it was not a waste of time. Now we try and stretch now. Yeah, but um, I got thrown, I got thrown <coughs> off a horse into a into a fence, a wooden fence, um, uh, probably about a year ago now. Oh, you're and still riding now. Uh, no, I don't get the opportunity very often, okay. but um, I was doing some work for a lady who had some horses, and she had one that wasn't broke, and um, my idea was to oh to get God. on this pony, and um, and it didn't... How I, old was it? It was seven years old, I think. Oh, so yeah. not young then. No. You're trying to break a mm. horse in that... Um He's set in its ways. Yeah, it's a, yeah. <laughs> and it had its. I was I was lunging it, um, and it was doing okay like that. And it had the saddle on, and I could, I could kind of lie over its back and everything. And but the problem was I was only doing it on the weekends, and I mean it really needed to be done every day. And um, but I was just quite keen to, so I hopped on, and it it just bolted, and the gate was open to oh my God. to where the stables were, and it wanted to get into the stables. And oh my God! That was going from the grass onto the concrete, so then I was I was half being thrown off, but I thought I want to come off on the grass, not on the concrete, and um, but it's it happened so fast, and then I basically got thrown into the wooden fence on that goes in like the threshold to the concrete. And it just knocked the wind out of me. And my daughter was was there, and she was videoing it on her phone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when uh, when you go and you can you can on the touch screen you can move the video so you can see the frames going. Po yeah. Yeah. And uh, so you can go forwards and backwards from the moment of impact. And I just folded myself over completely. I you, you wouldn't oh, think backwards. your body can do that backwards. Or um, sideways. Oh my god. Yeah, um, and I just, I was literally seeing stars, like, um, like just in, do you know what I mean? Have you, yeah, just like, like you're seeing glitter and then it goes black and I had to just lie down when I was just thinking like, I, th I think it was two of my kids were basically there and I was like, I need to get up and, and not be, yeah, you know, look okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I like just get up. I'm like, oh, I'm okay, I'm okay. And then I'm just seeing these stars. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to lie down for a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, after that, I still, um, I can't bend down to put my shoes on like I used to. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm like, I have to stretch to get it back to that, you know? It's, um, yeah. Um, and I've, I've also had like a trapped nerve in my shoulder. And I, I know it's all because I'm not stretching. Um, so, mm. yeah. 
I was uh, I was out walking with dog when I when I had a dog. Mm. I was out walking with dog, um, and we were in a this is in Colchester actually in a field there, and I would I had a rugby ball. And I was just me and the dog, and Dave, Dave the dog, he was a big, he was a king poodle cross with a spring of spaniels, a big old unit. And I used to boot the rugby ball up in the air, and then I'd try and catch it before he could get to it, because he was chasing <laughs> the ball. <coughs> <laughs> I booted the ball up, and I'm sprinting now, because it's a bit where I thought, oh, can I make it? Yeah, sprinting for the ball, and he's off, like, coming at a right angle to me. While I get to the ball, he doesn't see me, doesn't stop. And he took my legs out from underneath me. I went up in the air. I was, I was going full tilt. He was going full tilt too. I went up in the air, <laughs> turned over in the air, and I hit the ground like you. And I, I hit the ground so hard. I, oh, my God. My kids weren't there, mm. but there was a lady who was out to be stretching <laughs> off. She was stretching <laughs> off over the other side of the field, like, no, you, you know, she, uh, Eight miles away, and I was like, I hit the deck. I was like, oh, and I thought, I've got to get up, and just look okay, because that yeah. was embarrassing. And I stood <laughs> up, and kind of like you, I was like, oh no, <laughs> and I had to get straight back down the floor. The pain was, and I just, I was, yeah. I was in a ball on the floor, just sitting there going, okay, who sees me? I just did tatters. I was in tatters yeah. Yeah. with my ribs. It was my ribs. Yeah. It was like, Fucking yeah. hell, it happens, though, doesn't it? Horses, though. I got, I nearly got knocked out by a horse once, in the most, in the stupidest way ever. Mm. I was in, it's our horse, and it was, um, uh. We was in the stable and I was mucking the sti- yeah. mucking it out and it was a big it was an Irish sport seventeen hand horse oh, wow. yeah okay. very beautiful boy he was yeah. and um, I turned round so I had my back to him and I turned round to I don't know do whatever to move the camera was it? anyway I turned round and mm-hmm. I turned my head round he was turning his head into mine and oh. cracked off my temple, yeah. And I, yeah. I went black for about yeah. a split second. I was like, whoa! Nearly, and that was the stars in my eyes. Nearly, yeah. nearly knocked me out. And it was just a slight head collision. Yeah. But his head must weigh, I don't know his head came up. Head must weigh about 20 kilos. Yeah. You know I mean? Such yeah. powerful creatures. Oh, unbelievably yeah. powerful. But, but so gentle as well. Yeah. So gentle, so beautiful, so mm-hmm. loving. Yeah. Like I do mean I'm saying like, right, funny now, I love I love horses. I like <clears throat> I, I I encouraged a couple of mates, power edge mates at mm. the time to cut uh, when I first started riding to come and start riding with me. I ride yeah. at a riding school. Yeah. And they're like, what? No, we're not going horse riding, it's for women, it's for yeah. girls. Like, no, mate. Yeah. And the way I explained it was you like dogs. Mm. Like, yeah, you like dogs. Right. Imagine a dog that is big enough that you can ride. Yeah. That's it, that's what a horse is. It's the same thing. It's the yeah. same thing. Yeah. They're as obedient. Mm. They're as friendly, as good natured as the, like the nicest good natured dog you've got. You can ride them. Mm. <laughs> that's it. They're just massive dogs. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, okay, let's do it. And they're yeah. riding. But, um, I find it such a pity that it's um, it's it's that it's become seen that way, like a like a women's sport. Um, I mean, it, oh, I suppose it never used to be. I mean, this is uh, UK-wise, though. Yeah. I mean, I mean, what's it like in South Africa? It's not perceived like that, is it? Well, I mean, it's the I guess the show jumping and <coughs> dressage and all that kind of stuff. I used is, to do dressage. Yeah, yeah. I think that yeah. is. Um, in my job, it's is. not. I I never knew any guys that did that. I I knew girls that did it. No wonder why but, it is like yeah, that. Then I don't know. I think. Um, it's a good point. Yeah, I don't know. Um, hmm. I I've never done that kind of stuff i've just ridden like what you call hacking here just just go yeah. out and ride that that's what i like to do my eldest is at, thinking about it my eldest is at um an equestrian mm. college and i've never seen any boys there mm. in the class yeah in, like in the i when i see in the, i've not been in the class but mm. i see her with her friends yeah stuff I, and i never noticed any boys it's a really good point actually when i think about when i think about livery yards and stables and stuff it's mostly women who work there yeah why is that? I wonder whether is it, I, I need to look into that. To do with the with the the clothes that they wear, like the, the <laughs> jumper. What do you call it? Jodpers. Jodpers. Yeah, jodpers. Um, and just the just the, <laughs> what? the, the, the horse, horse what's riding, the logic here? The horse riding fashion is um, it's more feminine, I would say. It's well, yeah, like like you'd say, uh, lycra for cycling. There's a lot of people that won't get into it because I'm not going to wear lycra. Um, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I um, was talking about this in cycling the other day, yeah. a, a, about a week ago, and it, I mean, like the observation was cyclists are fucking weird, as mm. in road cyclists yeah. are weird. Why do they wear all that kit? Like, yeah. Why do they? Why do they wear that kit? Like they're pros. 
yeah. and hot and like yeah. fat, and you've got a big beer belly or something yeah. and the big overweight bloke and you're wearing all the lycra don't it's wear the, the power, lycra mate let's work on your weight first <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the lycra isn't making any difference yeah. work on your weight then think about the lycra yeah. like, <laughs> the wind resistance is not the problem yeah. <laughs> it's gravity yeah. and your body mass <laughs> Yeah. It I mean, again, it's like it's that culture. It's weird. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, because yeah. um, yeah, uh, that's the only thing I can think. Because like, um, that's uh, oh, when the the dressage and I mean, uh, I guess it's it's in, what do they call it? English style riding. Yeah, there? and Western style. Western style. Yeah. Um, and the Western style is more cowboy kind of esque. So you like jeans and stuff like that um, yeah but they can think the, the one of the reasons they can do that i think is because <clears throat> it's a different sport it's a little bit easier yeah. as well the way they ride mm. and the, the kit they have is a little bit different yeah. so like a western saddle it's like an armchair yeah you've got it's loads of contact with the horse and the, even the stirrups mm. they're massive they're mm. huge yeah. whereas you think about like the english way yeah the saddles are really small so it's not a lot of contact with the body. Mm. The stirrups are really small, and it's not a lot of contact with your foot. It's on the balls of your toes. And it, so it's about minute movements, and you are moving about a lot more as well. So the, the choice of clothing. Yeah. I mean, I can, if I wore jeans, well, I have worn jeans in the past, actually, riding, but you get a bit of a rub, depending mm. on your crotch, yet, like around your groin and that, where the, the seam is. Mm. But... I think the job is not just more comfy. I've yeah. always thought a Western ride and American riding mm. is much easier, though. Yeah, I'm sure. It's. But it seems more like yeah, like you're saying, like an armchair. It's more relaxed. With but the, I think they had to do that because it's because that the sport over there is born from the actual necessity of utilitarian a, a horse yeah. riding and yeah. ranches and yeah. and uh, you know herding up the yeah rounding up the horse yeah. the the cattle, cattle and yeah all that um, yeah. And the, Where they're so out I all think, day on it. Yeah, exactly. Well, we've never liked that over here. Yeah. So I guess um, I always used to compare, keep jumping back to the cycling thing, but it's like uh, road cycling and mountain biking. It's different sports, mm. completely different. You know, Formula One or rally, it's, it's mm. a different, it's not the apples, apples and pears, you know. Um, you can't really compare them. But, but I... I think that in the same way that you, it's easier for blokes who don't do any cycling, they'll go mountain biking. So adventure training in the army. People, anybody, most people would want to go cycle, uh, mountain biking. But if you say road cycling, they're like, nah. But so I wonder if the the horse riding with the 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 get up just puts those blokes off, maybe. Because it's too ah, too so as different. opposed to it being attracted, an attractive place for women, you're thinking it's a not an attractive place for men. Exactly. Oh, that could yeah. well be the case. Yeah, yeah it could. You, yeah. yeah, it could well like be the case. Like a guy, a guy will go mountain biking <coughs> wearing some, you know, baggy shorts or whatever. That's that's fine. But that, if they don't come from a cycling background, but the, but the same bloke, you say, I'll oh, put on this this lycra and we're going to go, you know, ride up the road, and they're like, nope. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Um, and that, yeah, because there's dress codes when you compete riding. You know, I used to do the dressage. Yeah. It was it, you had to wear jodhpurs, riding, you know, proper riding boots, which you wear anyway. Mm. Jodhpurs. Um, it was a white shirt, like short sleeve white shirt with a tie, mm. and then white or black, you know, gloves. You know, yeah. as, in, yeah. as in riding gloves, like posh riding yeah. gloves, and then and in your hat. Yeah. Very camp. Yeah. Very camp. <laughs> yeah, very camp indeed. Um, yeah, and I think uh, I think that if it was more, if there was a horse riding here, there was more. I want to use the word ut utilitarian. I think that's the right word. Like a, it's a more real life applicable. Um, that because I think a lot of farmers see horses as a they just eat the grass and waste and destroy the soil. <laughs> kind of um, they they horses. Are, it's an expensive thing as well to get it's into here. Yeah, Very expensive. expensive yeah. So. If it's something that is more, if you can use a horse in a in a useful way, then it would be more popular with the, uh, with people with so How could you employ horses like in a modern day farm? Well, I I watch a lot of stuff on YouTube and stuff about, uh, I think uh, of how they do stuff in America, um, but I mean people use quad bikes and stuff like <coughs> that. Um, I think it you need to be actually committed to to doing it. Um, and almost find an excuse to do it. Um, so you could, 
yeah because uh, the i guess we don't have the big the ground isn't big enough here but if you so like going to check fences um but people do that on a quad bike it's faster yeah so yeah i don't really know but they're they're um what do they call it the manure mm. that must have benefits for mm, the soil yeah, yeah. But they take a lot of horses to produce a lot of it to make enough impact on your yeah, fertilizer. You wouldn't keep the horses just for their manure. No. Because you could keep cows and get manure and meat. Because you can sell bags of manure, can't you? People sell it. I've seen people sell it. Yeah. Well, and horse livery yards and that. And they've got oh, a massive yeah. mountain of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And they'll sell it for 10, 10 quid a bag or whatever, yeah. five quid a bag, or a pound a bag, maybe I've seen. It's like, Jesus. Hmm. Um, the other thing, I'd, I mean, I don't know the, the world of it here, but. Um, just training horses as well um, doesn't seem to be. A, I don't think people make money out of horses here, but the horses are expensive, so somebody must be making money. They do make money at horses, yeah. Then the horse trainer. I don't, I've got an uncle who was a horse trainer. I don't think he trains horses anymore just because of his age, but he was a horse trainer. He had one in the Grand National once. Mm. Um, uh, he's like Irish. Mm. He went over to. In fact, he went. In fact, to your point, actually, he went to Japan. For a number of years mm. to train horses in Japan because horse racing over there is major. There is money in it over here, but mm. it's in the racing side of things, yeah. and that's completely different to the recreational side of things. Yeah. Like the first horse we had when I when I when I was married, we had a um, that was a thoroughbred, mm -hmm. we had a thoroughbred, and it, we should not. We were both basically new riders. We should not have had that thoroughbred. It was a nutter as well. It was a nutter, absolute nutter, and uh, <laughs> yeah, the, um, my wife at the time came off. And uh, I fractured a hip, actually, oh. like a nightmare. But uh, but apart from that, like th th I mean, thoroughbreds are nutters because they're bred for racing. And this yeah. thing was a failed racehorse. Yeah. Because I think it was just I, I can't remember why it was a failed racehorse, but it was rapid. Yeah. Rapid, you know. But yeah. I don't know. It's uh, the other thing with it is it's a strange one because it's it is a class thing as well because there's the mm -hmm. cost of it. Yeah. Definitely a class thing. Yeah. But then again, like, I'm not upper class. I was riding, you know, my youngest is in, my eldest is in like a uh, equestrian college, mm. but it wasn't cheap to be able to manage those things. And we, for few, we like, um, you have to forego a lot of other luxuries in order to yeah. fund uh, any kind of a lifestyle aspect of, around horse riding. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, because um, I'd love to get a horse now. But um, yeah, it's just, it's the time, mate. It's time. yeah, it's the time and the and the money and it's like, like you're saying, you're child. gonna have to sacrifice. Something has to give to make space for something else in your life. Yeah, yeah. it's like yeah. having another child. Yeah, and the rest, mm. and the rest. I mean, probably be, be probably be a little bit easier for you because maybe if you could, you know, if you could it's stable it where yeah. you live, yeah, then. But you still, it's like it out. The it's like an extra burden, isn't it? Yeah. Out in the morning, feed the thing. Then you're gonna muck out at some point during the day, and then another feed in the evening, and then you know s stable maintenance and it's field maintenance and it's yeah all of it. and then and it's health maintenance. Yeah. And it's, oh my god! And in my mind, you have to be able to utilize it in your <coughs> in your work day, because otherwise you need to exercise it as well. Um, I don't want a horse to just just stand in the field. Um, and, and if you're exercising it outside of work, then that's more time as well. So it, it's figuring out whether that is, uh, something that can be done. Well, I think there's, there's a guy in, um, I came across it a while ago. There's a guy somewhere, I think like on Dartmoor near Accountant or something like that, that, um, that actually, um, because of the landscape, they can't use quad bikes. So he uses horses for his cattle. Um, and he, you can actually go over there and have like an experience, um, of, of rounding up the cattle with him. Um, mm. but yeah, so there's places that do stuff like that. And in America, there's loads of places like that. You can go on, uh, holidays where you round up the cattle with them and have just Must get that incredible. experience. Yeah. Must be incredible. Yeah. I yeah. toyed with the idea of doing an endurance ride years ago mm. on a horse, but it was like over 24 hours. I remember it was like 24 hours. It was 70 miles. It was 50 or 70 miles. But yeah. I didn't have the horse to be able to do that. And I, I thought, actually, it's probably not going to be that enjoyable. But I, I just enjoy it. So I just yeah. like riding so much. I, I used to go out with a backpack. Yeah. With my, with, so I used to go out on my horse, 
the youngest, or my eldest mm. at the time. She, eldest at the time, she's still my eldest now. <laughs> so my eldest at the time, she had a pony. Yeah. And um, in fact, she's still got the same pony now, it's just not rideable. Mm. And we used to, I used to go out back on, sa- on a Saturday, I'd have a backpack on, we'd ride out, we'd jump off in the field, like hack out, jump off in the field, tie the horses up, we'd have a picnic. Yeah. You know, and she was only, God, what would she have been then? We're talking... 11 years old, 10, yeah. 11 years old, yeah. and the dogs would be with us. The dogs yeah. would follow on behind. It's like just, that's a, just, that's a dream. Yeah, uh, unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. You know, that's only an hour, hour and a half, but but <laughs> that kind of does that justify the cost and the time? Yeah, yeah. You know, so most of the <laughs> you time. You need to well, be doing that yeah. regularly. Yeah, to, yeah, 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 yeah. That needs yeah. to be a lifestyle. Yeah. Um, I had that <laughs> idea when I, was, um, when I was helping this lady down, uh, down there with that horse that I fell off. Of because um, you've got the the South Downs on the coast. There's a there's a route that's um, it's a bridle way or that's is it a bridle way? I think it's a bridle way. Yeah, that's um, a hundred miles along the South Downs. It starts in Eastbourne and it finishes in Winchester. And I thought if you found um, farms or you know landowners along the way, so I don't know if you did like. Uh, 20 miles in a day or something um i don't know that might be a bit steep i don't know but um basically you you camp you have fields along the way and like you stopped off with your daughter there you you stop off and you set up camp mm. you could have like a, a support team that that meets you there and sets up the camp or whatever and it's basically this experience that people come and do this like a five five day um trip of doing that route on horseback mm. um i've done it on a bicycle um and it's a it's a pretty neat thing you know but yeah so then i thought is that there must be ways to to make money in that in that world or to make it work to incorporate it into to make it your, your i don't know because you're going to be sacrificing time basically yeah so you, just you could in the quad bike horse mm. example you could maybe say, oh, well, the horse is greener than the quad, but then is it mm. the supply chain for all the feed and the, uh, everything on yeah. a daily basis? And then even if it was, like you're saying, it's going to take you multiples of time. Let's say a morning patrol, mm. go and check the livestock, go and check the sheep and the yeah. cows, go and do X, Y, Z, which requires you to move around and get eyes on things. Yeah. Yeah. Quads faster. Yeah. Horse is not, you know, it's, I don't know, it's a hard argument to make. Yeah. Hard argument to make. Yeah. Well, it's, it's small. It, I've seen situations that I always think to myself, like getting, um, so I was on this <coughs> farm that had, they had, um, I think it was like 13, 13 cows that were calving. And um, they, situations where they needed to get one of them into a pen because it was struggling to carve. Um um, I think and it happened like twice, twice or three times um, with them. And the way that, that we got it in was, so it was quite a big field and there were like three of us or sometimes they got in like neighbors and everybody to come help. And you basically had to walk this field and get, get all of the cows um, too close to this pen or even in all of them into the pen because they'll, if one of them peels off, then that, that's it. They're all pushing through there. And um, cows are a lot faster than people on foot. Mm. So, um, uh, and the one time it took took uh, somebody with a with a truck to drive in the field and go alongside them, but uh, and it was just a lot of faffing around. And sometimes you just couldn't get them in, and then they 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 were heightened because they knew something's up that they don't want to be happening. So, so they just become impossible to get in, and you have to give up and try again the next day or something. And I just thought. Um, if you had the right horses to do this, then it would be a lot. It would just be a lot easier. Mm. But yeah. then you could use dogs as well, like like do- they use dogs for sheep. Mm. They use dogs for cattle as well, and that's a lot cheaper to keep dogs. There but is, they're, but there, they're expensive. There is an to advantage buy with a horse over a quad bike in that. The they horse doesn't make direction. noise. The horse doesn't yeah. make noise. The quad bike does. Mm. Well, I, I I used to do some security work at uh, the Royal Windsor Horse Show every mm. year as part of when, I was, when I was in the industry mm. I would do some there and uh, we to do a lot of work on foot so cutting about on foot all day long for days at a time patrols basically mm. and uh, I 
the boss of the company, a guy called Doug Hinkley, Doug Hinkley great guy. He's, he's um, been on the podcast before, ex, ex-cavalry officer. Can I say cavalry? Yeah, I'm sure he's a cavalry officer. Um, and I, I, I had him persuaded at one point to have a horse. So for that event and other events, mm. have a security horse, get mm. an old police horse and have a horse. And I would go around on the horse. I was the only one in the team that could ride as well. Mm. And uh, I would, you would patrol on the horse. You yeah. cover more ground. It's yeah. not, it's, you know, again, not, not quad, not making noise. Also, it's in keeping with the event, which yeah. is a horse, <laughs> which is a horse event. But, yeah. you know, and it's a spectacle, just be cool. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I ended, I ended up not working there again and change, change industries. But mm. uh, there's definitely applications there. It's just... It's costly. Mm. It'd be nice to see. It would be nice to see. I, I don't know. I don't know. I think. I think it's a pipe dream. Yeah. We should look at it though. Oh yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna hit. I'm gonna hit stop. Make, make yeah. a coffee. One sec. Cool. And then I want to know about um, Korea. Yeah. We are back. You've moved even further back on that chair. You slid yourself. <laughs> <laughs> like the most relaxed good? man. Um, is that good? Yeah, it's fine. I think yeah. it's fine. I'll just move it about. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, where were we? Oh, Korea. Yeah, Korea. Right. How did you end up in Korea? When When did you go there? And why? Oh, South Korea, Korea. I should say. It wasn't North. Okay. It was South. I thought, I thought you were saying Korea. <laughs> no, Korea. Korea. Okay. Yeah. So, well, I am saying Korea. Yeah. K O R E A. Yeah. Not Korea. K A K A I E R. Okay. Um. So I. Like we were talking about earlier about the delusions of my cycling career. Um, <laughs> or lack of cycling yeah, career. Yeah. yeah. So uh, when I realized that that was not going to be a career, then I didn't know what to what to do um, for a career. How bad um, did that sting? How did you realize? What was the realization? Um, so the f- first year after high school, I went to Belgium and um, I couldn't even finish a race like i just got destroyed um the the level was so much higher whereas like in in the races that i was doing in south africa i was i wasn't winning races but you're holding your own yeah yeah um and i went there and just you know this the speed the intensity everything was just through the roof and i only lasted um I think a month and a half. I wanted to be there three months and I just psychologically couldn't carry on anymore because I was go- just going to like two or three races a week, starting them, um, getting spat out and then getting to try to train harder, but just be getting, destroying myself basically. Um, and so did you know anyone when you went there? Were you going to join a team? Were you part of anyone? How were you so, doing it? So, um, there was a, there was a guy who, um, was a few years ahead of me at my high school. I can't remember how I bumped into him because I didn't meet him at a high school, but um, he was basically in my in, from my town and um, I met him and uh, I used to go training with him and he went to go race over there and it, there was this guy, uh, it was actually an English cl- club called Kings North International Wheelers and they, so it was, a club set up in England, but um, their racing was based in Belgium. And there was this legend of a guy called Staff Boon, who was the uh, Belgian guy who ran the club over there. And he he rented out accommodation to people f- that came to race from yeah. basically Commonwealth countries, really, um, and from England, um, or from the UK, I should say. So, um, and so people would come over and you have to pay rent you're pretty sure you paid rent yeah um to to this guy's stuff and um then you stayed in this house and it's like being a student it's like 10 10 cyclists living in a house and then you get given the the race kit that you wore and um you'd either cycle to the race because there's just loads of these races going on there it's the mad cycling culture um uh, or or you'd get driven there in a van or something, um, and um, so this this guy that I was sort of training with in in my hometown, uh, he'd got some connection to go there, so he went and did it um, the year before I did. So I piggybacked on his connections to to go over and do that. Um, yeah, and just got got destroyed there, and then came back to South Africa. 
but uh, um, just that experience there, um, I, fu- it, I was at a higher level when I came back, even though I was getting destroyed over there, I came back and I found I was doing really well, um, or better at least in the races in South Africa. Um, so I just carried on and the following year, um, I was out training and I met a guy, um, I cycled, caught up to a guy who was cycling and as I passed him, he, he said something to me in Dutch and I clicked that it was Dutch. And, um, so I started talking to him. Um, why? Oh, because you've been out to Europe. Yeah. Just yeah. cause, um, just being such a fan of the sport and this, mm. this Dutch guy cycling there, like, I was just like curious about, it. Mm. and also uh, it was one of the cool things about the sport is you, you'd go out training for like uh, you, multiple hours, you're out riding and you meet somebody and you spark up really interesting conversations with strangers, but be- because you're both riding a bicycle. Um, and yeah, got chatting with him and it turned out that he had a company, um, in Holland that did waterbeds and he had two sons that basically ran this company for him and he said oh come come stay you can stay um with us and work in the waterbed shop and do the races with my sons so I was like okay cool so (laughs) and um so uh we um basically he had to meet my my mum, um, so she didn't think I was going because I was like, oh, I was I was nineteen, I think. Um, you know, Chatted <laughs> up by some dude in Lycra. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, but he was a really interesting guy because he had um, he also he came to South Africa because there's a there's a, a race that happens every year there, and um, a friend of 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 this guy, his name was Chris Chris Bongers, and um, he his friend was a blind cyclist so he he basically oh, wow. rode on the back of the tandem um and then he had a like a his pilot they call it rides in the front and he was like like world world class level as a blind cyclist um and he came to do a race in South Africa and that, that's why this Chris Bongers came out with him uh anyway so went back and and did some installed some waterbeds in Holland and and did some races there the following year and um also I managed slightly better but still pitiful really um and then after that I was like well I can't you know I to bridge that gap is impossible and I I'd run out of um money to to fund myself racing basically um uh, so I just realized i have to actually do something because mm-hmm. so, so up until then i'd been delivering pizzas in the evening and that w- that was how i got money and i and living at home um so so yeah so my cycling failed and um and then i was like well my dad was a teacher so i ended up going to university to try to be a teacher but i enjoyed primary school a lot so i thought i'll be a primary school teacher and when i started you mean you enjoy primary school as a pupil yeah yeah <laughs> so the logic being you'd enjoy yeah. it as a teacher yes <laughs> <laughs> um i think i i think i i liked my teachers when i was in primary school right yeah in, yeah, in yeah. high school as well but i just I don't, I don't know why i just decided to go that route and um but then when i started studying like um, a bachelor's of education then it was it wasn't very stimulating um and i'd also you know it's such a big tangent You're talking about career career the country um, but um i yeah i i basically didn't i wanted more from from what i was studying um so i ended up doing a ba degree but um in uh, my majors were political science and sociology. Oh, you, and you completed them? You made I completed them, yeah. that, oh, yeah. Um, and th- sociology? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, but by the time I'd finished it, I was like, what now? Because you, you could carry on studying further 
and I guess become an academic or go work at like a think tank or something, but that also required studying further. But I just didn't want to do that. Um, so I had no idea what to do, but I'd stumbled into writing articles for somebody that, um, that, ho that made websites for people. Um, and I would write content for the websites that while I was a student. Um, so off the back of that, I like kind of, a portfolio I'd built up doing that. I got a job for a company in Cape Town doing, doing the same thing really. Um, and I did that for about a year. Um, but it just wasn't, um, I didn't enjoy it. And, um, then a, a friend of mine from high school, I was chatting with him on, um, on whatever chat platform there was at that point on, on the computer, on the internet. Uh, I sound like such an old man. <laughs> what did you have? What was it then? You had Microsoft. I wanted uh, Messenger. I see. You had IC, ICQ. Remember ICQ? You had that. No, I ICQ. We had. I think it was MSN. MSN chat. Messenger. Yeah, that's it. MSN. Yeah. 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 And then it was. It was probably Facebook. Facebook. No. Like chat. In the nineties. No, this was. So this was two thousand and. Oh, of course it was. Yeah. About 2007, let's say 2006. Facebook was just starting in yeah. 07. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was just we oh, had, I, yeah. ICQ was 90s. I was, okay, oh, okay. Got it, okay. Um, so anyway, MySpace. MySpace. Yes, <laughs> I had a MySpace profile with my one. <laughs> I had one friend called Tom that I think everybody had. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, this friend of mine is teaching in Korea, and we, he is telling me about it. Um, so he showed me how to find a job there and everything. And basically there's loads of these, um, uh, they call them academies. That is like an after school tutor, tutor academy. Like kids go after school, they go to these places where they practice maths and, um, and English. Yeah. And so the English is what I was there because as a, as a native English speaker, you can help them with their pronunciation and basically just practice speaking. Um, so, yeah, so I got a job over there in a, a city called uh, Pohang, um, which is like a steel, a steel port city. It's, it's, um, it's worlds away from like Seoul in to terms of like um, being uh, international yeah like so so uh what i mean by that is nobody could speak english um well like barely anybody so you felt really isolated and but in in the city center they had these bars that they call uh, they called them like i can't remember english bars or foreign bars but there were basically two of them um one was called whistlers and the other one was called beethoven i think and um <laughs> you'd you'd go there and then you'd meet up with other english speakers or and there were lots of uh, there was a us marine camp um on the edge of the city as well so that's where you went to actually be able to speak to somebody um uh yeah so i went there with the idea of like making money and part of the contract is they give you accommodation um and then they the, and then they pay you every month so I thought I'm going to go there and make a lot of money not spend money and then what was the work yeah. routine so um, obviously the, 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 the kids would go to school first and then they come afterwards so uh, <coughs> I started I think it was a one o'clock in the afternoon was it just you how were they if they didn't speak English or were you learning it how did you the, communicate with them um, so they were yes I just spoke English to them um and I mean, they were pretty good, mm. actually. The, when I say nobody could speak English, it was like the, the adults. It yep. Just it was rare to meet somebody that could speak English um, fluently enough to have a conversation. Um, even the even the the director, which was the boss of the academy, <laughs> couldn't really speak English very well. <laughs> um, the irony. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. And was it yeah. based in Pohang, the company? This one was, yeah. So, what, what's po describe Pohang? I mean, what's it like compared to? We well, mentioned Seoul, which we assume you went to, but what's it like compared to? Um, I don't know, Cape Town or. It's, um, it's very. 
so Korea, you obviously had the Korean War, and then I think America put a lot of um, support in after the war to help build up South Korea. Um, so um, a lot of the infrastructure is reminiscent of the American, like kind of grid, grid pattern things. Um, but at the same time, worlds away from it, it's um, hard to describe it. A lot of poverty fact, there or not? It didn't look like it to me. Um, but, I mean, my interaction with... So I had the 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 lady that I work, that was the director. She would take me um, to have dinner with uh, her. She took me once with dinner with her family and all of different friends of hers and stuff. Um, but my interaction was mainly in the bar the bars that I went to. The English bars. Yeah. yeah. So there were some Koreans would come in there and the bar staff were Koreans. Um, so you could talk with them, but, um, and they generally could speak English a bit better because that's where they were going to an English bar. Um, but poverty, it didn't look like it. Not the kind of poverty that you see in South Africa. But yeah, I guess poverty and... Um, is relative like mm. yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah um so how different was the culture the korean people very different i felt like i felt like i was on a different planet really uh, yeah what was the most um, surprising aspects of it um, or challenging challenging was the food was really challenging for me go on like um so it was just the just the taste of and the textures and everything that so they've got um one thing that they really have a lot of, they call it kimchi. It's like fermented cabbage. I like kimchi. Really? Yeah. Do you not like kimchi? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they, the, my favorite thing of their It's really food, good for you. Kimchi's for, great for you. Yeah, apparently. They keep saying that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and rice. They have a lot of rice, but I do like rice, so that was fine. Um, and they always told me that rice gives you power. I guess the, the carbohydrates. They would say that. Yeah. Rice gives you power. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, but I, one of the first things I got given to eat was, um, uh, I can't remember what they call it now, but it's like, you know, you have um, sushi is just rolled up in the seaweed. Yeah. So it was, it was rice rolled up in the seaweed and it had vegetables on the inside of it. Oh, I know. What yeah. are they called? I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and so I had You're describing that. nice food here. So yeah, that's, yeah. What was the problem then? So the first you experience grumpy I had, of, yeah. grumpy, grumpy, <laughs> drum, grumpy South African. But yeah, the first experience I had of of any food in Korea was give, being given one a piece of this, and oh. um, I just met my my boss, um, and she gives it to me, and I ate it, and it had, it's just it was just alien to me. The the whatever was in it, I swallowed it, and part of it didn't go down my throat, so. My gag reflex is terrible, and I had some kind of vegetable matter, like maybe a boiled spring onion or something. I don't know what, it, or um, I don't know what it was, but it was stuck in my throat on the way down, and I was trying really hard not to gag, and it, it had a smell to it that I didn't was it just alien to me, and I just Did it was you puke? A bad no, but I was like watering in the eyes trying oh, no. not to. Yeah. Trying not to, you know, try to be polite. Um, that was my first experience. Uh, um, other memorable things was we um, were eating. It was also my boss invited me to come eat, and they were eating a crab, and it was a massive crab. Like the the body of it was like, uh, like you a know, plate, a yeah, plate yeah. Guy, yeah, and then the legs all spread out, and they were sort of like eating the the from the legs and stuff, and it's all cool. Um, and then <laughs> we were, which, you know, I, I wouldn't say I like that, but I, I don't mind it. It's like eating crayfish or something. Um, and, and I was having a cigarette. I started smoking when I was there and I stopped smoking just before I left. <laughs> it's like, it's a weird time period of, yeah. um, but anyway, I was having a cigarette and, um, I, I don't know why, but I decided to, um, to tap my ash into the middle part of the crab because it just looked like nobody was going to eat. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't look like something you were going to eat. You're at the dinner table. Yeah. People have been eating from the crab and you 
put your ash into the middle of the crumb. Was yeah. it instinct? Was it like instinctive that you did I, it? You I thought, oh, I've... that's finished. Where do I put my ash? In yeah. The... <laughs> yeah, not even, not even like, uh, not killing the, not squashing the butt out, just tapping a bit of ash. And it, it looked like, um, you know, telling you about it, it's like, why on earth would you do that? But <laughs> at the time, it just seemed like a logical thing to do. <laughs> it didn't look like somebody was going to eat that. Yeah, that, that's... Um, how did that funny. go down? How Not very well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they got a bit upset. But what did they say to you? They they were speaking Korean, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I could just tell by the tone that it Brilliant. wasn't a, wasn't a good Brilliant. thing. Yeah, um, and I also had. Uh, <clears throat> but what they do do is um, they call it bulgogi, and um, bull is, bull is fire, and gogi is is meat. Um, so it's a bit barbecue and then so you go to like a restaurant and they've got a little gas grill in the middle and then they give they bring you the the meat as like raw strips of steak or something and you barbecue it yourself yeah oh, nice. uh, yeah and then they've got like different uh leaves like kind of like a lettuce leaf um that you can then put the meat into that and they've got little bits and pots around the table like pak choy or something like that I don't know what that is. Oh, I'm pretty sure it's from. I'm pretty sure it's Korean. I'm pretty sure oh, Pak okay. Choi is Korean, but it look, it's like a lettuce, but in a different shape, and it's stunning. Oh, okay. Beautiful. Yeah, it yeah. looks like kind of like a giant um, uh, mint leaf. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. it's Pak Choi, but go on. Yeah. I'm pull up the picture. yeah. Um, so, so you put all the little bits that you want, like a piece of uh, garlic or something that you you can barbecue all this stuff, and then you put it into the leaf, wrap it up. Uh, no, that's it? not that's oh, right, not the okay. one. Um, anyway, but um, I think I do remember seeing that though. Just didn't know what it was. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I like that because I was basically just eating meat, um, which was normal for me. <laughs> and um, I would have thought yeah. it'd be a lot of a lot of um, seafood out there. Yeah, there was. There was. Um, I got invited also for for a meal that was. Um, fish but it wasn't cooked fish it was just raw strips of fish um i and i didn't really like that so but this was with my boss's parents i think and they spoke zero english but i managed to communicate that they, they were actually very accommodating because they brought the the um the little barbecue thing out and they let me cook my fish on the barbecue <laughs> thing while they were eating it raw <laughs> The most interesting thing I saw of seafood there was um, somebody had a bowl of kind of like cal calamari rings, the, but they were about the, the <coughs> circumference of a finger, and a, but it looked like your tongue, like the oh. t like your taste buds, like oh, really? pink. What was it? I don't know. And it, but it moved around in. Oh it was still moving. Oh my god! These little oh, you know, um, you know those crisps that they are. I think they're called hoops. Hula hoops. Hula hoops, yeah. It was like that, except made out of the texture of your tongue. Like you could see taste buds all around it. And it was moving. Mm. Oh, my God. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know what on earth it Did you eat it? No. <laughs> um, they do like to eat living things, don't they? Yeah. Like China squid. do it. Like oh, those, those yeah. Far East yeah. uh, um, sort of, I don't know what I was going to say, like Oriental type places or whatever you call them. Mm. Uh Alive things. I mean, you go and look on TikTok or YouTube, and like that, you can see them. I mean, the, yeah, the, swallowing a live squid. I don't think I saw that in real life. Frogs. Fro have you seen them eating live frogs? No. They eat a live frog. Mental. See, I saw I saw on some TV thing of um, a little girl in South America eating live um, spiders, like furry ones, like tarantulas oh or something. My. Oh, no. Yeah, Why and she loves that. that. She just was like playing with them. They crawl on her arm and stuff, and and then she just pops it in her mouth and eats it. That is a little murderer. Yeah, she is. <laughs> she is going to grow up and be a serial killer. That's not yeah. normal. That's not normal. All those little hairs in your mouth. Like zero yeah. empathy. That's why I struggle with anything like <laughs> yeah. that. You'd be like, I feel for the frog. I feel mm. for the octopus. Kill it first. Yeah. <laughs> I'll eat it then. Yeah. And then I don't care about his feelings. I, mean, yeah. I can see it moving. I don't want to be I don't want to be a part of it. Yeah. Oh no, I couldn't think of anything worse. Yeah. No. Having yeah. said that, I, I worked on a Chinese I think the closest thing I've come to that, I worked on a Chinese oil rig on land, oh, wow. oil rig in Iraq yeah. uh, years ago. Hmm. And uh, they would, so it was, man, that was my first uh, experience of actual proper Chinese food yeah. and Chinese culture. Yeah. Again, like worlds apart. 
albeit yeah. on a on an oil rig. Mm. Um, but they used to serve up uh, regularly a soup. They would call it a soup. It was basically water, just water, not even any salt or anything in it. Water, but yeah. in the water was these baby squid, mini squid, okay. tiny, like yeah. mini octopus. Okay. They were smaller, probably. I mean, you're talking not even the size of my hand. Like, do you think they were actually proper? Like, they were babies. Oh, they were. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I don't think they were baby. That well, they, oh, they were a really small, 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 <laughs> really small species, <laughs> really small species of okay. octopus. But they yeah. were 100. percent They had yeah. tentacles. <laughs> they looked yeah. like an octopus. It's really right. small, and they'd serve up this. I mean, when I say small, probably the length of your finger. That's yeah. how small they were. Wow. And there'd be a soup full of them, but yeah. they'd be dead. Okay. You know, I'd eat them. They yeah. were alright. Huh. Yeah, but but we're just just It'd be strange. It's cool to have that in a fish tank. There's a yeah yeah. <laughs> there's a there's a train of thought amongst some uh, uh, parts of uh, uh, say science and an- anthropologists and things mm. who believe that uh, Asians chi- Chinese mm. Chinese predominantly are a different species to the rest of humans. Oh. So you know, like back yeah. in the in the day, it was Homo Homo erectus and Homo mm. sapiens. Like we lived side by side at one point. So it was two types of human. Yeah. They think that Chinese are another type of human. There's Chinese and there's the rest of the world. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, um, but most I mean, people think it's bullshit, yeah. and it probably is. Yeah. But it's interesting because yeah. they are very different. Yeah. Very very different. Yeah. But then. Um, People from different uh, continents, different eth- ethnicities, I guess, are are very different. Like, um, <coughs> yeah. So where's the where's the line? Where do you draw a line between a different um, species as such? Well, you do, I mean, on that, you do at the genetic level, wouldn't you? Like, mm. what does the DNA look like? Is our DNA the same, or is it yeah. not? Yeah. I know. I don't yeah. know. Not the I'm a DNA expert or anthropologist or biologist or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, because surely it's got to be, surely it's got to be the same because, well, isn't it, I don't know, isn't like a, some kind of chimpanzee only like one thing? Oh, that's, I don't know. I think, you know, if there's a little difference, it becomes a complete Mm. different animal. Yeah. 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 What were the, uh, in, uh, in, in South Korea, Mm. what were the, what were the school kids like compared to what your experience of being a school kid and seeing school kids in uh, anywhere else in the world? So, because the stereotype is that yeah. Asians are really keen learners and really great academically, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, when I we were talking earlier about how conservative South Africa is, and so the, they would do things that we just wouldn't do in the classroom, and I don't know if that was taking advantage <laughs> because. It's not proper school. The Koreans would. Yeah. Mm. Like what? So, um, so they've got this thing. The the uh, the most far out thing is um, they've got this thing that they do. Like kids would give each other a wedgie. I don't know if kids still do that, but um, a wedgie. But basically, they would come with with their two hands put together like they're going to pray, and they'd come up behind somebody and thrust up your butt crack and pu- oh, God. <laughs> push your push your trousers. <laughs> In, into your butt crack and they and they'd say dong chim as they did it <laughs> and, uh, what does that mean i don't know <laughs> um um i don't know if i knew what that meant i'm gonna look yeah, yeah. dong yeah. chim so just fucking about like kids yeah but what academically um, what they like um uh, well i don't think they're the kids that i was um Helping. Do you want to know what it means? Yeah. I just googled it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dong chim. Yeah. Which tra- one second? Dong chim, which tra- which translate? I'll tell you what it translates as. Dong chim is a popular prank that involves using your index fingers to poke someone between the bum cheeks with as much force as you can muster. <laughs> the the translation is poop needle. <laughs> <laughs> poop needle. Yeah. Dong chim and the poop yeah. needle. My God, <laughs> love it, yeah. love it. Um. Yeah, because I, I across the across the street from where I was teaching was a prim, was a school, I think <laughs> primary school, and I saw one of the kids do it to to a, like a teacher or something, an adult. Oh my there. god! Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. So maybe maybe that is. Um, uh, yeah. The, my so my experience of them wasn't necessarily like a high academic level, but more that that uh, cheekiness, um, but. Uh, I mean, they, they for considering it's learning uh, English that they don't speak to anybody on a daily basis. They actually <clears throat> spoke it quite well. Um, 
Uh, so uh, that would have taken a bit of um, application in your studies to be mm. able to do that. Um, and I mean, I don't know what their other academic levels were like for anything. Um, but certainly they they didn't come to the after school academy. It, most of them didn't come with the like this fastidious um, attitude towards growing academically. Mm. They were just... The, I, it felt, you know, it's just kids that they finish school for the day and they just actually want to have fun, I guess. So I found it quite difficult to to control the volume in the class and stuff like that. Mm. Um, yeah, I realized I shouldn't probably shouldn't be a teacher. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you've been like on a journey of discovery in loads of different types of industries and jobs and and uh, yeah. and uh, and even like well aspirations of being a, a pro cyclist yeah. through, throughout your life mm. do you think where you are now mm. farming mm. do you think this is where you need to be um i think so and i think that in one there's so much variety in it so you know i can't say that the the job that i'm in now is where i should be for the rest of of my time but i think um i think it's it's the it suits me the the most to I can't think of anything else I'd rather do. How is it yeah. ticking the boxes? Um I I feel like so I've got a, a really good team that I'm working with. I find that most of the time with, with work it's the people that you're working with makes a massive difference. Um but I can spend I can spend most of the day without really <coughs> seeing anybody. Um but the things that I'm doing, um, so I do like uh, a lot of kind of maintenance and jobs, fixing things as well. So those, everything that I do like that, I know that that makes life better for somebody else that works there or easier or it solves a problem for them. Um, and I get, I get a real buzz from, from, from that. Um, like what I'm doing is actually making a difference to somebody else. Um, so, how is that bus created? Is that because that's the environment you're in, the team you're in, that 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 kind of, you know, that everyone working for everyone else, team play, like you get in yeah. the military, right? You get mm -hmm. that, you get that. Yeah. Everyone is part of the machine and everyone needs to contribute, and yeah. otherwise the machine breaks down. Yeah. So I've actually, um, I found in the <coughs> army some jobs seemed like thankless jobs, like you only got noticed when you did something wrong, um, but. There were always people there that saw what you're doing and appreciated what you're doing if you did something helpful. And um, I think there must be some kind of a dopamine effect in, in when you get acknowledged for something like that. Um, but on the other hand, I've also I've also come to realize that um, it's really good for you if you can get that kick without anybody knowing that you've done something like um to be able to to do the the thankless job but take pride in what you're doing um and nobody needs to know what you've done but you know you've done it and you know you've done it well um that that's uh, that's is kind of a recent thing that I've that I've learned that if you can get a kick from that then then you don't rely on other people to give you that dopamine. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's so many. I see it. I, I notice, certainly notice it more now for, some, for whatever reason. Mm. And it's people who do something and, the, and they, re, they do a good thing, but the reason they're doing it is because they want gratitude. Yeah. That shouldn't be the reason you're doing something. No. You should be doing something because that, exactly what you said, mm. that is material, materially changing something for the better. Yeah. You shouldn't be doing it because you want gratitude or recognition. Yeah. Yeah, I agree 100%. Because yeah. it's, you, it's like a set of false premise. You're kidding yourself. Yeah. You know, it's not the good thing should be giving you the dopamine hit, not the gratitude. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's a bit of a, I'm very aware of that, of that, um, of that it makes me feel good to do something that some, and somebody's happy that you've done it. But, um, I, I like the idea of, <coughs> of just getting on and doing something and knowing that you've done it. Um, and just, just being content with, with, with what you're doing. Um, and my job at the moment, I get, I get left to to do find a problem and sort it out don't have to tell me what the problem is just you know um 
so it's a real you can then you also start taking ownership of of the things um because and i i try to have the attitude that um if this was my property um how would i want to do it you know um and so treat the place like my own um and it, in that way hopefully doing as best a job as possible for for my employer um but also making it making it a nice place for me to be because i because it's kept better mm. um how did you go f- how did you get there from the military how did you end up in, in the job okay so we, yeah in the army like we were talking earlier about uh, my perception of what the what it was going to be like in the army it was like um uh it was cold and cold and muddy when you're out on exercise cold and wet um and um i i didn't really like that um and uh i think that's why i ended up doing a lot of sport would played a big thing like my cycling was a big part of my career actually um and and then ended up in like in G4 in the supply chain um it allowed me to do do jobs that were useful that i felt were useful um and i had to do less cold wet stuff <laughs> 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 uh, uh yeah and um anyway where were we going so how did you end up at the uh, farm oh yeah oh yeah so i was going to say i i after about not very <coughs> long in when i went to to afghan for a brief stint um and when I was there, it's, it was, um, that was like, I, I thought to myself, this is going to be the pinnacle of it because, um, probably, you know, the Afghan was winding down. It's not going to be another conflict. And I was at that point, I had, um, two kids already. And I was like, if there is another <coughs> conflict, I don't even think I, I want to be there because I want to be with my kids. And I was like, my phase of life, it's, it, it doesn't line up anymore. So I was looking to get out of the army from before my four year point basically I was thinking about it and um so I actually signed off um at my probably at my four year point um but then I chickened out because I couldn't th- I didn't know what I wanted to do I wanted I knew I wanted to get out but I didn't know what I wanted to do and um so then I signed back on when you sign off you've got a year to to get your things in order before you actually leave um and in that time people start giving you a lot more freedom and all of a sudden the army is actually a really fun place to be um so i was like signed off and then i started really enjoying it and pe- i got way more time for doing my cycling and it was life was good so i signed back on again <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, it went like this this roller coaster like sign off and then life is good and then and then a few years later, like, it was immediately shit again, was it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. So, but the time that I actually left the army was the third time that I'd signed off. Third time that I'd given notice, but it was the only time that I <coughs> actually handed in my um, ID card. Um, and yeah, so so I knew I wanted to do something else, but I didn't know what it was. But um, in in the last um probably a couple of years that I was in I started thinking um more about cuz I was like looking at truck driving I was out of desperation for doing something different I was just looking at what what could I do um and so at some point somehow I came I came across I think it was after going to California with work and just knowing realizing when I was there I want to be out. I I want to be um, in the countryside. I don't want to be. Um, yeah, the California reminded me of South Africa because it's big, big sky and just open. And um, I was like, maybe. Um, I was like, maybe there's something, you know. And I don't know how I stumbled into it, but I started looking at farm farm jobs or. I don't know how I started, but came across on like on Facebook or maybe it was on LinkedIn um, across this organization called Forces Farming. Um, and 
um, sent a message to to forces farming and saying like uh, um you know so they essentially were helping serving or ex serving people to get into into the world of farming and um so I sent a message to say um you know I'm interested to see what kind of opportunities there are because I want to get out the army um not really expecting much from it and um it was like quite quickly i got a response back from from a guy called jeremy gibbs jeremy's been on the yeah. podcast yeah. yeah jeremy's good good yeah. friend of the, good and friend it's immediately really um really engaged and like i just felt like he was actually putting a lot of uh effort into communicating with me um and i was so i was really like impressed by that and he's um he set up uh, a meeting for me to meet with um, a guy who was, um, I can't remember his name or, or who he served with, but I, I'm pretty sure he was an officer. Um, and he he left the army and I think he went to study agriculture and then started as like volunteering his help to a farmer and ended up being, basically he's a farm manager now. Um, and um so i had a he, he made an introduction for me to meet this guy and uh i met him at the farm that he was that he lived on and um I had a chat with him and and he was also really helpful he asked me to send me send him my cv and he helped me put some changes to it and all that kind of stuff um and then from then i just kept in touch with jeremy and um I was kind of asking him if there was somewhere that's that, that I could do <coughs> I work experience kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um but it just so happened that I stumbled across a place where I could do get some work experience um while I was still in the army, but I'd signed off. Um and um yeah, so so I was doing like a Okay, so I've the way was the question how I got into it. <laughs> yeah, how did you get yeah. out of the minute you get into the job you're in now? Yeah, because I remember you telling me before that like, yeah, you do, mm. you were doing some weekends and basically a couple of days at a, at a farm for yeah. free. Yeah, right, and yeah. Uh, and get the experience of be actually working on a farm. Yeah, so so um, yeah, after being in touch with Jeremy, <clears throat> he ba he gave me the the belief that this is actually something that I can do, um, even though I had no idea how. Um, and so I came across on a post on Facebook by a local farmer, um, local to where I was based, that um, they've got a uh, a lane, that, a green lane they call it, that you can drive through that cuts through their land. And somebody had driven through their land and knocked over um, like two fence posts. And um, they, they showed photos of, of the damage and saying like now – they have to repair this on the weekend um, where they could have been spending time with the kids kind of thing. And so I sent a message to that farmer. He's got a page for his, for his farm. Sent a message and said, um, I'd love to um, help you out with repairing, repairing the fence, you know, or any other um, jobs that you've, that you've got to do. Um, if um if you're happy for me to help help out i'd be happy to do that just for the experience of doing it um so he, he sent me a message back and asked me invited me over for to have a cup of coffee um and said he said he didn't want to take my weekends away from me because that's what i was offering at that point um but come come have a cup of coffee and i'll show you around he said so i went and they took me into the kitchen and um gave me a cup of coffee and just talked about the farm and um and, and we just chatted and um i said actually you know i've got wednesday afternoons w where we get given to go do sports i could and friday afternoons because we finish by lunchtime on friday um so i could potentially on those two days i could actually come do some bits for you um <coughs> and and so we just came to an agreement in his kitchen like that we'd do that um so and then i approached my chain of command and said, oh, I've got some work experience lined up that will give me some good experience. And they were happy with that. So, yeah, so I started doing Wednesday afternoons and Friday afternoons. I'd go 
over and it was really good experience because like they had um so they had a herd of sussex cattle and um i the timing worked out well for me that i was there for quite a few uh carvings um so i got the experience of that um and yeah then they would um he would also let me use like um his machinery like the tractor and telehandler he'd show me oh this is how you do it and then then you just go do it <laughs> <laughs> so he put so much trust in me yeah. yeah um with such like machinery like that that you know if you if you push it the wrong way at the wrong time you can take out you can cause quite a bit of damage yeah um so put a lot of trust in me to to do that kind of thing um and yeah so that was i just um absolutely loved working there and um it was like the hardest thing for me leaving oh really yeah um <laughs> oh my goodness we yeah. choked it up it was hard, <laughs> wasn't it? look at that it's normally me that choked up oh yeah. interesting so yeah. you had to, you had, did you have to leave because you left the military yeah, yeah. so you're so, still in touch with that guy yeah oh cool yeah um yeah when i left so the the way that i actually got out the army like i talk about it like i escaped was because my brother's got a landscaping business um down on the coast and um and he invited me to go work with him um so then i knew i've got something concrete that i can go into because i need to provide for my family um yeah the, the problem about leaving the army when you've already got a family established and you don't do a full mm. career uh, if you don't you know you don't have a pension and all that i think at any point it's scary leaving um but uh i at least knew i had a job there that paid you could tell me how much you could pay and i knew i can feed my family um so yes yeah, so, what was so hard, sorry what, yeah. sorry what was so hard about leaving the farm because i wasn't going to be doing that when i left um i just fell in love with the farm and the yeah. people yeah and the cattle ah. yeah and um yeah i just said i would have loved to work on that farm absolutely huh. <laughs> you don't get i know i know yeah sorry i, I mean I'm, I'm asking because we we you know we we've spoken offline i've spoken to jeremy a lot of times about the similarities between what how rewarding and how stimulating uh work in the agricultural industry can be compared to the military mm -hmm. i think it's really hard to replicate some things and that, that's why i was asking about it because yeah. you, you, you know you explain it there it's like it's just Probably like where you work now as well on on the farm you're at now is to, to your point you said earlier yeah. everything you do on a daily basis impacts everything it's yeah. like holistic and you see it and it's yeah. a small and I'm just making the assumption I grew up on a farm yeah. right but I was I grew up on a farm I was now a farm I got to help out with certain things so I have kind of an understanding yeah. you know it's you're a small crew yeah everything impacts everything else so it's yeah. super important to be at the right piece of the yeah. machine the right cog in in you know in, in the machine yeah. and if and if and if you are and if everybody is it just you're it's family yeah and uh, again to the to the animals and the farms get a lot of crap farmers get a lot of crap about from wrong part of society where they make out that animals are treated really badly mm. and they're not you know no. the fact of the matter is they, they, they care, they're as much of the family as anything else you know? yeah so, sorry to upset yeah. like upset no, no, I, I mean it's it's uh it's i find it ridiculous sometimes what sets me off um but yeah i i was there for carving that went bad as well oh and okay. um and just being <clears throat> there and it was really hard for them like they really what, care how, how about it go bad? what multiple but, carvings going bad or? um i have to try to think now to be accurate but i know there was one was stillborn mm. that was stuck um oh, no. so it was quite like i needed to get the vet out to to pull it out and um yeah like quite quite gruesome um and uh yeah just seeing like they really cared about those animals mm. yeah um but i i don't always i don't understand sometimes how my emotions get tied up there's a lot i was also emotional to you to leave my subunit um so it was just a hard time yeah. you know well like a break from something that you know and i absolutely loved working with my brother um 
but it was because I was working for my brother, um, not because of what I was doing with him. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so I worked with him for like a, a year, just or a year and a half. Um, but it was known from the beginning that I was going to be trying to look for uh, an opportunity where my family could live on a farm, where I could work on the farm, they, my kids could grow up on the farm. Um, so, um, so pretty much as soon as I got settled down there, I started looking for opportunities to do weekend work on a farm down there as well. Um, and I was in touch with um, Jeremy Gibbs um, in that time as well. But there's not a lot going on down there. Um, but I happened to... Um, I came across a guy um, down there who, who had a, kind of a small operation going. Um, and a brilliant guy. He So... Jeremy knew him, but I th so this guy is called uh, James Wright, and he he actually he works for a company that does has an app that manages cattle um, and sheep. I think it does as well. Um, but he and he had some of he had his own herd and uh, and a barn. He was a tenant farmer over the, down on the coast, um, and it happened that he was he had a young child. Um, and it was actually useful to him to have somebody on a Saturday to come help him out so that he could get things done quicker and then he could spend more time with his family. So, um, yeah, so I started helping him out on Saturday mornings down down there. And, and then he was, like, really keen to help me get a job because he was happy with what I was doing for him. Um, so he was give, giving me contacts of his or letting people know about me and I went to uh, two or three interviews, um, which it needed to be so specific, the job that I was going into, because I didn't have a load of experience. I've got no agricultural qualifications. Um, <coughs> but I also needed a house for my family to stay on, because um, that that was what I wanted. So that was kind of the, the what the deal needed to look like. Um, and uh yeah i was just at the point of kind of every time i went for an interview you you kind of put yourself in the in the mindset of if i'm going here like what's that going to look like for the family is this going to work and stuff and um it's quite an emotional roller coaster of kind of investing yourself into like you know when you enter the lottery and you kind of think how you're going to spend your money <laughs> it's kind yeah. of like you you thinking what this is going to look like because if you don't do that then you won't know if it's the bad if it's a wrong choice so um it became quite draining doing that and i was just a lot of pressure on yourself yeah yeah so i just got to the point where i thought you know what i'm just gonna carry on working on the weekends with james um and do like focus on improving my skills with my brother doing the lands landscape construction jobs um and just, you know, just try to enjoy life like that. Um, and I was enjoying it, actually. I was, like, really, like, working with my brother. And the the Saturday mornings when I was um, working for James, so he had um, he had uh, Devon cattle. And uh, he got me involved with, like, and they had, uh, he had to castrate the steers and stuff. So that was an experience I hadn't had before. And, um, oh. <laughs> and, um, and just, like, deworming and just working... My favorite thing is just working the cattle, and um, he he and he also let me use his telehandler a lot, like just um, doing the bedding when they were barn in the barn over the uh, winter and whatnot. Um, so I did gain a lot of experience just from doing like like four hours every Saturday, and then uh, and then it got to the point where he his tenancy ran out there and they didn't want to renew it, so he moved on. Um, and he was desperately trying to help me find something before he left, um, but uh, nothing came of that. Um, and then I ended up doing bits for the lady that had horses in the stables that were kind of next door to the barn. So so even though uh, James left, um, I still carried on in that same place. Um, and yeah, I was, I was just enjoying life really, actually. Um, and then... And then uh, I followed up with, like I was saying, I just kept in touch with uh, Jeremy Gibbs from Forces Farming. And um, 
my brother and I decided during the summer holidays we were going to take uh, every Wednesday off to spend time with the family. So I said to, <laughs> so while he spent time with his family, I said to Jeremy Gibbs, um, can I come up on a Wednesday and <laughs> if there's anything I can do to, you know, to help you out or anything like that. And so he, so he said, yeah, sure. And I, I came up to him the one Wednesday and um, I did, I uh, was changing the, changing the teeth on a, on a harrow, I think, or no, on a topping machine. And um, so I was doing that while he went off for a meeting somewhere and then um, it worked out quite well because he, he got delayed, but I finished that job and was just in time to eat my lunch. And then, and then he came back and then, and then went off and did some topping uh, and, um, and some, some stuff went wrong even on that day when I was there, like, um, the, yeah, it, it wasn't a good day for him. Shame. Um, yeah, he had quite a bad day, but I was like so grateful to be there because it was just another day of experience for me and I uh, got some insight into what he does and, um, yeah. And, uh, soon after that, he, he messaged me to say that he's got potentially an opportunity for me. And it was this job that was like, they needed somebody who could do handyman jobs and, um, and help out, um, with, with animals. Um, and it came with a house and, um, and it was like, I was looking at these things. Like, I can do all these things because the, the previous jobs that I'd looked at was like, um, a bit, a bit of a stretch for my, like it's herdsman jobs. I, I, don't have enough experience or knowledge to to be in charge of that mm. it's what i was aspiring to but i wasn't there yet um and this was the first job that i was like well i can actually do this um and then so i went for uh, an interview with that door and went to go see see the house and everything was just matching up uh perfectly well, they how did they come to jeremy were they specifically after a military um hmm I think Jeremy had visited, he's so good at like, um, what do you call it? Networking. He hmm. seems to know, like that's or he knew this guy that I was working for. You said there. that so, then like a proper farmer, like it's something completely alien. What do you call that thing? Yeah. Uh, networking, is <laughs> <Yeah>. it? <laughs> yeah, networking. Yeah. yeah. yeah cause like, <laughs> I, I don't know how people do it because I. We're doing yeah. it now, mate. We're doing yeah. it now. <laughs> you know, we, the reason we met is through yeah. basically networking, if you yeah. want to call it that. It's True, just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's just, it's, sometimes it's just organically. But yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I guess my idea of it was like, oh, sending message to somebody on LinkedIn or something yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, I don't like. Yeah. That. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so so Jeremy had, I think he had visited this farm, he, and he'd somehow he'd met the person that was involved, that was in charge of recruiting, um, and so that person said to him, oh, the, does he know of anybody, considering what he does, help getting veterans in two positions they've got another veteran that works for them in a different capacity as well um so yeah so i think that's that's how it came about um and then yeah he basically put me forward and i went for an interview and uh, yeah and then i did uh, like a two months it was, a, it was supposed to be like a one month trial period um and it started off all right and then i got <laughs> there was a bug going around the farm and um i got really sick like oh, no. yeah and um yeah it's like terrible timing but it it had been going around everybody and then so this where i'm working is like four no it's three hours three and a half hours from where we were living down the coast oh right yeah so my family was staying in the house that we were renting on the coast and i was coming up to do the month of um trial period yeah Oh, and then wow. I got sick and like, I'm talking like, um, I got out of bed and went to the bathroom and was like, I was dizzy just, I, just to make that like journey, to, journey mm. was, um, yeah, I was just in a bad way. So then, um, and they were really good at like, um, they obviously could see I was, was ill. And, um, so my wife came to get me basically and took me, took me back down there and, um, and I recovered, and then that must have been. Were you were you crapping yourself? Like yeah, you blown it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but my. it gets worse because I because <laughs> then I came back and um, did like one or two days of work, and then I got um, 
I got this pain. I went to bed and I thought my shoulder blade was like this tingling in my shoulder blade. And I went to bed and the next morning I woke up and about half an hour after I got out of bed, I had this excruciating pain going from my neck all the way down, down my left arm to my fingertip. And I'd actually had it before a few years ago. So I knew it was a trapped nerve. And, uh, but it's so painful. So, and it happened on, on the weekend. My wife happened to be up here with the kids. So she took me to like the A&E here. Um, and, um, I just said to, they did, they thought it might be something to do with my heart because, because it was on my left hand side, mm. I guess. So they're doing all these scans and everything. And, um, they basically sent me away with, um, paracetamol. But uh, that didn't touch oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, yeah, so I ended up, um, yeah, I, uh, oh no, they gave me another, they gave me Cocodamol as okay. well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, um, so I stayed here. My wife went back down to the coast and I stayed up at the farm. And uh, the next day I was like, no, this is, uh, it was feeling better because I was doped up on Cocodamol. But um, the next morning, I was like, no, this I, this is, I can't. <laughs> it's like the pain is like, you just want to like bash your head on the wall really? or something. Yeah. And um, not even that, I was just collapsed in myself. So like a real pitiful sight, like just folded <laughs> over on a chair. Yeah. And um, like the, like the first, like day, day one of the, or, or day two of the first ever exercise you ran on the military and yeah. realized it was cold and wet. And yeah. yeah. Just like, oh no, yeah. I made a mistake. Uh, I'll come back to it, but I've actually got a history of like, of like my first day at, um, at phase two training. I had also had a bad experience. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I was in so much pain and that, so they basically said, just, just go, they, uh, first, they tried to get me to A and E again here, and I waited for hours in the A and E um, because it wasn't I wasn't like gushing out blood or something, so they, it wasn't a priority. But I was in so much pain, and uh, I ended up having to go back down to the coast for like uh, I think a week and a half. <coughs> so yeah, in my trial period, so that's why it got extended to a two month trial period. But I had to go see. Uh, I saw. A, um, uh, like a chiropractor down there and uh i got much better pain pain medication and um yeah but it's it was a horrendous start i, I reckon but, they were just thinking he is broken the military yeah. has broken him he's just a broken yeah. man you got to give him the benefit yeah. of the doubt he's broken he's not even that old <laughs> yeah even now it annoys me because every now and then it's like there's some heavy lifting they ask me to come help with and they're like oh but be careful your shoulder and i'm like what <laughs> my, my shoulder's fine <laughs> brilliant yeah brilliant um, yeah, but on my first day at um, at phase two training, driving up there, I was like, my stomach didn't feel good, and um, the, the I was up the whole night basically with DNV, uh, oh, no. and then the first day, like standing on parade, they sent they 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 sent us like running down the street and back again, some punishment for something, and I got back and I was just like started seeing stars, and then I threw <laughs> threw up. <laughs> like at the boots of the instructor oh, no. and um and they're like what uh so yeah i got bedded down for like a day and then i was um and that was like the start of my f i don't know it's just like bad coincidence yeah, of yeah, yeah. just starting something well new. there's one common denominator in it there is a mm. common denominator in all these things you yeah <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. you are the problem brilliant brilliant <laughs> yeah yeah are you still so you still obviously you're still there now yeah so now yeah so uh, i've been there for a like, since November, well, November I started my trial. Um, November just gone. Yeah, really. Yeah, so it's. Oh, quite, I thought you'd been new. there longer than that. No, no. Oh wow. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but it's it's really good. My my time is uh, my days are really varied um, in what I do. Like it can, anything from fixing like a door handle to to fixing a fence and and feeding the animals and um, just looking out for their. Uh, general welfare and stuff like that um yeah i absolutely love it and like because and living on the farm i can go for a long time without even leaving the farm um my wife generally does the like the grocery shopping because she ties it in with the school the school run um so yeah i can spend i spend like most of the week just on the farm 
um, in my own little world, mm. my own little bubble. Yeah. So, Amazing. Yeah. Sounds great, mate. Mm. I love it. You know, mm. I, I, I really enjoy growing up on the farm and, and, uh, and I, and it's one of the reasons I'm, I'm glad Jeremy does what he does. It's mm. like, I think, I, I really do think that the agricultural industry is another industry which people leave in made they're just not on their radar and it should be yeah as a really good option a really good option yeah you know, just just the thing especially for blokes especially for blokes yeah. just you, you, you just just doing you can do hands as much hands-on stuff as you want to do you can do as much brain work stuff as you want to do as a mix of the two you know just the culture and the environment and the people it just it's very very similar i think yeah. to, to the yeah. military i mean not identical and, mm. and also very different but it's as similar as you're going to get yeah in any industry when you uh for uh, to the military for, compared to other industries you know yeah. um i'd love to do, I, I would i would genuinely yeah. a different i couldn't do it now but in a different yeah. life I'd, I'd work on a farm you know what's really funny is like i was talking about like getting out of the cold and the wet <laughs> it's it's funny how it's a different thing though because i really don't mind it now like spending all day outside um but i think when you <coughs> when you you're not um sleeping in it mm. um and I, yeah i didn't think that um it's just it's funny to think that the things that i didn't like well yeah that's that's probably the difference sleeping in it like it when you went out on a on an exercise and it was horrendous it was like intense on a small period of time like yeah. really uncomfortable um for a short period of time um and and it's only like a few times in the year it's it's like, yeah the other thing with the military though is there's no opportunity to get cold uh, to get warm and dry yeah you know <laughs> yeah what I mean? that's you're on right. a 10-day exercise and you get wet on day one and it's winter yeah you are you're going to be in that same situation on day 10 yes in tatter probably yeah. Probably, yeah. you know what I mean. You can, you know, you can dry your feet off and get get some wet, get some dry socks on. But if your boots are wet, yeah, you, yeah. You, they're getting wet straight away. You yeah, know, so. yeah. There's ways you can yeah. just pop pop back to the house and change your socks. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. And and you can choose exactly what you want to wear. What's what you think is appropriate for the situation. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah exactly. So, yeah. But it, it's funny to think that uh, things that I was trying to avoid in the military. It was also like when you're working, uh, working in in the hangar or something, and then you need to go out and and <laughs> get cold and wet. That seems like a hard thing to do to just go out and and then come back. But when you're out there the whole day, it just becomes you get acclimatized to it, I guess. Mm. Um, yeah, but I do find it funny how I'm quite comfortable now being outdoors, and you know, I don't even think about what what the weather is more motivated yeah. to do it right yeah, there's a reason true. for it it's good. Yeah. I've got, we've got to start wrapping it up we're mm. going to get some go and get a bite to eat but no it's good man I'm glad it's mm. like I'm glad like I said I'm glad that uh, glad it's worked out for you but also I'm really glad that um, it's come partly you know through through well a lot to do with Jeremy you know because yeah, he's yeah. such a yeah. good guy man yeah. forces farming is such a good thing yeah you know so, so I'm really glad about yeah. um, and, and it's it's motivation for him you know, yeah. he's such a he graft. Yeah. He absolutely graft. And so um, I know he's really proud of, you know, like uh, what you're doing and where you're at. Mm. And I've, been, I've played a part in that. I'm right. And, he, and, and rightly so. And you should yeah. be, you know. Yeah. In the he, same way, you should be proud you're there because, mm. like, I, I mean, I joked about you doing these all these different industries and different avenues and mm. different things, but there's a, you've had a willingness there, motivation to try different things, put yourself out of your comfort zone, think and realize I'm not, content where i am and, yeah. and take leaps of faith like mm -hmm. trying to you know try trying to get like the role that you're after where you can get a house provided for you in an industry where you know you haven't you not you haven't got the qualifications stuff expected for most of the roles that are available yeah. again it's that's a leap of faith yeah. i mean it must be hard for you i reckon it was hard for your wife yeah <laughs> I I would really like to be flying them all some of those conversations sometimes, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Epic. Epic. But no, mate, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank been you. Absolute Thanks pleasure. for having me. Um, anything, well, yeah. Anything we we didn't cover you wanted to cover? I don't think um, so. We didn't come yeah. in with any intent, did we? We're just going to no. shoot the shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's worked out well. Cool. Well, yeah. let's um, let's go get a bite to eat. Cool. And uh, okay. good luck with the rest of it. Yeah. Thank you. All mm. right. Mate.